thank you for coming um, to our talk called um, ME-CFS, Long COVID and Other Infection Associated Chronic Conditions and What They Teach Us. I wanted to thank um, the speakers, the Department of Medicine and uh, our community um, co-sponsors, MassME and FM Association. Um, they have a table outside if you wanna um, after go and look out their association. It's a wonderful um, group that helps support patients and provide medical education. Um, so my name is Dr. Halis Luss. I'm from the Department of Medicine, and I'll start with a short introduction on ME, CFS, and long COVID. It's going to be very short <laughs> because we have several speakers today, um, and then we'll take a little break as we bring on um, Patricia Fennell, our first speaker. So um, also I'll go over the program just real quick. As I mentioned, I'll be doing a first um, intro. We'll then be followed um, by Patricia Fennell, who will give us a great talk on ME-CFS and long COVID, clinical considerations from a phase perspective. Um, this was a phenomenal way to provide support for patients and for um, providers to traverse the complications of a chronic condition. Um, the last part was that we were going to discuss with Stacey Stevens and Todd Davenport, a masking PEM, which is po post-exertional malaise, a very critical component of ME-CFS. Um, and they're going to talk about assessing disability and its pathophysiology using a two-day cardiopulmonary exercise test. Um, so as, as I mentioned before, I'm going to give a very brief introduction to ME-CFS, long COVID, and IECCs, but pretty much focus focus on ME-CFS as an example of one of these. Um, I'll talk about their shared complexity and health inequity that are involved with many of these diseases. Um, so I have no conflicts to report. I am um, very uh, pleased to be a board member of the Massachusetts ME-CFS and FM Association. Um, and as I mentioned, they're a wonderful community group that really supports patients and educational outreach. So what are infection-associated chronic conditions and illnesses? Where did, where did this word come about? Um, it's also referred to as IACCs. So where the, the choosing of these words are important. Um, illness for some people may be perceived as just an unhealthy state, um, as the person isn't feeling well and they just need to you know, rest and get over maybe what they're feeling. Um, so it's not sometimes recognized as a more permanent chronic condition. Um, I've included it in the talk, however, because I think for the popular uh, people con conception of it, they really do have heard chronic illness for some time. So I didn't want to exclude those people. Now condition um, has sort of begun to be seen as a real medical condition, one that's a lasting unhealthy state. And that is what is happens with many of these chronic conditions. They're not just a matter of like two months, three months, for many patients in ME-CFS, this can even be years, even 30 to 40, or even some people 50 years with this condition now. Um, now disease, we all know, is usually a defined defect in a biological um, structure or a functioning part of the biology. So therefore it's more defined, um, and you can think of like diabetes an example. Now IACCs are also multi-systemic in nature. That's what they all have in common. Um, you'll find, and I'll, I'll show many of the symptoms um, that, you know, there could be, they might report like headaches, body aches, fatigue, pain. Um, and some of these examples, as I mentioned, is ME, CFS, which is myalgic encephalomyelitis and chronic fatigue syndrome. And I'll go over the reason of those uh, two names in a minute. Long COVID, which is the longer um, uh, a chronic condition that results from a SARS-CoV-2 infection, also persistent Lyme disease, multiple, multiple sclerosis or MS, we are recognizing now is highly associated with Epstein-Barr or EBV infection. Now, um, the links between these infections and their lasting symptoms are not very understood yet, um, but it does give a very serious, you know, debilitating consequence to that. Um, and unfortunately, many of these patients experiencing these long-term conditions um, face barriers for seeking diagnosis, treatment, and care. So I hope to go over a little bit of this as we can sort of think of like ways to, uh, for the providers to maybe better take care of these patients um, and for more information too for the patients. 
So this very complicated slide, I apologize, everything's on one, <laughs> um, gives a little bit of the background of ME-CFS, but also a concept of how these illnesses have not been um, understood or even in sometimes maligned from the, um, based on the political environment. So if you focus on the green box, those are the early epidemics that led to some of the first characterizations of ME-CFS. For instance, in 1934, there were several outbreaks, um, and that was described as uh, um, epidemic neuromyasthenia. Um, and it was first thought to be associated with polo, but it didn't quite match the, the um, profile of a polo infection. Polio, sorry, not polo. <laughs> um, then in Iceland in 1946, another outbreak occurred, which was very you know, uh, unusual and um, brought to the attention of the medical community. And that was given the Icelandic disease name. And then there were several smaller ones in between, but a notable one was in the Royal Free Hospital in the United Kingdom. This occurred between 1955 and 1957. Um, and it was mostly healthcare workers, so they were direct in contact with the patients and some patients. Um, now, this uh, sort of led on and, and was eventually recognized. And if you look at the red arrow, um, who actually recognized um, these neurologic diseases? Um, and if you go on a little further to the turquoise box, you'll see some more current um, epidemics. Again, in between, there were several different smaller outbreaks. One notable one was an inclined village in Nevada in 1984. Now there, there was a lot of, um, unfortunately, uh, maybe like, like delayed effort by the CDC, um, a little bit of political influence not to have it called like an epidemic and truly studied. Um, and that became sort of associated with this word chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, at the same time in the 1980s, many patients were again reporting this and forming groups and support groups. And one name that appeared um, because of the connection with maybe EV EBV has been recognized as having long-term symptoms was called chronic EBV. That was in the 80s. Um, and then also a group which was originator of the Mass ME CFS and FM Association was this group called Chronic Fatigue Immune Dysfunction Syndrome. Now, I think they were actually very ahead of their time because much data now shows the um, connection with immune dysfunction. Now, if you look at the bottom portion of the slide, there's like a lilac um, uh, section. And those, so these, the, the bottom section shows the three different kind of thinkings, thoughts of how these diseases could be. The top one, the lilac, is mostly a neurological description of the disease as occurred early on in the Royal Free Hospital. The middle light green one is sort of a concept more of fatigue rather than actually looking at it as a full neurologic disease. So in some ways it was sort of brought up and patients feel that way in a sort of dismissive way of looking at the whole disease as a solid biological event. Um, so if you look at the, the green one, you'll see that in CDC, they first described um, chronic fatigue syndrome, 1987 to 1988. Later on, this was um, re-evaluated and a new criteria was set up by Fukuda et al. in 1994, also determining it as chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, again, not sort of taking into account um, the neurological aspects and also this aspect of post-exertional malaise. Now that first appeared with um, as early as the benign myologic encephalomitis um, description in 1955, there was already a recognition, and Ramsey described that in 1988, of muscle fatigue after effort. So if you follow again on the light green, um, the Fukuda did not actually specify this muscle fatigue after effort, or now it's known as PEM, post-exertional malaise. Um, uh, this was also updated in the CDC's Reeves criteria in 2003, but it mostly focused on chronic fatigue um, again. Now, if you look at the bottom orange, these are uh, representations of how there was political fight uh, or a malignment of these patients to sort of be seen as just inventing their disease and maybe, you know, um, and actually it, it unfortunately highly influenced the providers at the time to sort of really break apart these patients being one believed and also 
the community, the medical community accepting it as a disease. Um, one very important part with this was done by McVerty and Beard, who were two United Kingdom psychiatrists. Um, and they basically wrote a paper in 1970 and um, decided that all the previous epidemics were what was called mass hysteria. And one of the reasons was that also because mostly women were reporting these diseases. So you can imagine women hysterical, so hysteria. Um, this was actually followed up again uh, with a report in 1978 of neurologic myasthenia, but in this time it was determined to be a psychosocial demonstration again. Um, and that was, if you see here, compared to what the patients, it sort of correlates the time, 1978, to the early time when the patients felt that they couldn't find a home in a medical uh, environment. So that, that's why also that drove all the beginning of all these um, patient support groups, because when they weren't being believed, two, they didn't have a way to go and get um, treatment. Um, and then eventually, if you keep looking at the orange box, you'll see that even in our popular discussion, um, these patients were maligned. And one word, uh, I don't know if you remember, <laughs> what they were called was um, a lot of discussion of yuppie flu. Like, oh, you're just, you have too much going for you, so you're tired. Um, and then also what became a common uh, uh, diagnosis for these patients was conversion disorder. And that was the thought that, oh, you really are just wanting, you're taking, you know, not wanting to do things or being upset about something, and then you're manifesting that in your body. Um, and this sort of correlated with a, if you look at the bottom of the orange box, um, this thought that patients just need to get out of bed and get a desire to feel better because what's just keeping them homesick is a lack of desire to get better. And entwined with that became this idea that, oh, they just have to go out and exercise. Now, if you remember Ramsey as early as, you know, the 1980s as well, but even earlier in the 1950s, it was already observed that the patients would do worse if they exercise, like they had this definite muscle fatigue um, and patients were reporting this, but that was still being promoted finally, but it took many years and a lot of effort in 2006, 17, that was finally removed from the UK guidelines. Um, so no more graded exercise therapy, which is very different than like modest activity. Um, they were finally saying, it actually can cause damage. Now the CDC followed up in 2021, um, they removed um, GET or GET, uh, graded exercise therapy as well as CBT from their website. And this is important because even up until 10 years ago, I have a family member who the first thing they were prescribed was graded exercise therapy. No, you're not doing well, well you know, you just need to get up and get active. And even describing a lot of the uh, you know, the phenotypes they're exhibiting or the profile, like, well, if they do something, it makes them worse. There was, it was very hard, I think, even for physicians or providers to hear that when the recommendation is, you know, just get them up, get them exercising. Um, so now, uh, if you look up to the top right corner, um, what you'll see is a group of um, ICD-10 codes. Um, as I mentioned, if you look at the red arrow, the WHO actually, the World Health Organization recognized ME or myalgic encephalomitis in, in 1969 and recognized it as a neurological disease. This was followed in the United States only in 2015 when ME itself was given a code of 93.2. Um, now this was updated in 2022 um, because at some point, there, as I mentioned, there was a dis disparate view of like chronic fatigue, fatigue syndrome and ME. So though ME was there already, a lot of physicians, if you came in and you said, oh, I'm fatigued, you know, this is happening, I have a headache, um, they would give chronic fatigue, otherwise non-specified, and weren't aware of the ME designation because ME was a neurological presentation. Um, and so those two were fused in 2022. And there's some talk now of the World Health Organization also updating that. Um, and then the thoughts for the future of that is that maybe there will be actually this um, 
removal of chronic fatigue syndrome that could be you know a and post viral syndrome which truly do happen patients do have infections and can feel fatigued but they do get better you know with time and maybe even with exercise but this is very different than the components of me which uh, has this a specific post exertional malaise where if you do exercise and I have to say, it's not just exercise, it's any activity. So for some patients, just reading can cause them to come into what's called a crash. Um, for my family member, it was brushing their teeth. If they brush their teeth, they had to stay in bed for two days. And, you know, that's hard to see. It's hard to understand. And then what do you do with it? Um, and so it's good to see this transition, you know, away from trying to malign the patients and this came also about with the SARS-CoV-2 um, pandemic that led to, you know, a realization that COVID-19 could cause long-term sym symptoms. And what we know now is long COVID, originally called PASC as well for post-acute sequela. Um, and what has been found is that patients that have long COVID do develop MECFS. And that's not unexpected as it was from all these previous um, outbreaks, although the etiological factor wasn't identified, it was already in the literature. So let's go on. Um, so here to give an idea, and there are many um, of these IACCs, and I um, will focus today on MECFS. So prior to the pandemic, if you look on the left at the orange um, arrow, um, the population was roughly 320 million, um, and several uh, community outreach surveys determined the prevalence because, as I mentioned, there was no clear um, ICD-10 code. It was sort of put in the fatigue, generalized fatigue. It's hard to differentiate going back to medical records. And ME sort of was, because of political um, movements too, was falling out of favor to being used and recognized as a neurological component. Um, so pre-pandemic, um, it was thought there was about 1.4 billion people. And then um, several uh, researchers did a great job in looking at the economic impact and uh, determined that that was between 36 and $51 billion. And some of these very profound effects on the economy and also the person are also being found now for long COVID. And after the pandemic, as I mentioned, um, a fair amount of people, it had been observed that several of the people with long COVID meet the criteria of MECFS. They have, um, which I'll go over in a minute, um, but especially this post-exertional malaise I referred to. Now, the population um, at that time, I'm giving April 2024 as an example, um, let's say 336 million um, and uh, I'm using the a House Pulse survey. Um, there's many very good research articles out there of looking, you know, at cross like following patients, determining the percents. But I wanted to use, you know, something that actually went directly to the person and not like a re recruited study. Those two have their, um, you know, um, great their great resources. So this House pul Household Pulse survey conducted by the CDC asked people um, if they had had COVID, if they had long COVID and they described, you know, what they thought was long COVID, um, and then if they still have long COVID. So about 30% of people from COVID, according to the study, said that they did have long COVID at one time, and 10% um, in April 2024 um, said they have still have long COVID. Now, this percent has fluctuated. I'm giving you this one time just to sort of capture that ME has a big um, role now in um, an impact. And one, one study had, as I mentioned, had suggested that of the patients with long COVID, 50% meet the criteria of ME. Now using this um, calculation and then adding those new numbers, which is now 7.5 million, with the pre-pandemic, you know, in case there were a separate group of patients, that brings it up to 9.1 million, which is a substantial number. And that, if you extrapolate, um, suggests an impact of 218 to 300 billion. 
Now, there are some studies that look also like directly at people that have COVID and ask them, you know, what, what percent of that. And then it, it sort of equals out. This is sort of a five to 10% if you ask from long COVID and that those numbers also appear to have like a five to 10%. So there is a, a an alignment with these ways of studying it. But what it does say is that even pre-pandemic, 1.5 people, a million people is still a fair large population of disease and it's comparable to um, patients that have MS. Um, oh, sorry, I had I, I got ahead of myself. I even made a little thing to show that I moved on. <laughs> so we've covered this already the, the after the pandemic. And here is the slides showing um, several of the in, um, symptoms with this is ME CFS. But if you look, there's a lot of similarities with long COVID. Long COVID is reported to have 200, you know, all varying percents of symptoms and ME at least 90 or so. Um, some are not overlapping, some are overlapping. Um, and then ME, um, because retroactively, it's hard to go back and say like, what was it, you know, what exactly was the infectious agent, but with uh, interviews and surveys, it's found that um, a fair amount of people first reported being sick with some infection and then never getting better. Um, however, there are instances where people can have physical trauma, such as a concussion, and that also has led to MECFS. Also, um, exposure to environmental toxins has been reported to also induce MECFS. Now, if you look at the right, um, there's the description of all the different um, uh, symptoms. And at the top, as I mentioned, is the post-exertional malaise, or PEM. Now, that is, as I mentioned, it's an intolerance to um, uh, not just exercise, it's intolerance to exertion. So as I mentioned, brushing teeth, it could be reading, it could be walking just to the bathroom, or it could be a light form of exercise. Um, and then the bottom two, if you see the stars, those are also very uh, strongly also reported, which is fatigue, just in general fatigue, and sleep disturbance. And if you go back to the top, one of the most debilitating symptom, symptoms are headaches, migraines, and cognitive issue. And that usually is um, also referred to as we've all heard, we all maybe all experienced, is brain fog. Um, and then also under that are sensory issues, um, hearing, visual sensitivity, um, there's also probably an immune component, such as sore throat, tender lymph nodes, and further down, if you look at the yellow line, um, you can have hives or allergies, and that's a high association with MECFS. And then also some um, respiratory issues, um, you know, laboring for breath. Um, and then if we look further, there's cardiovascular um, tachycardia. Um, then also further down, you'll see urinary issues. Um, and then we go to the gut, which also can be involved, which is IBS-like symptoms, um, also constipation or diarrhea, and then menstrual difficulties with a lot of the young women and older women who report MECFS. Now, those all sort of fall into the each area, but they also can be um, covered by what's called dysautonomia, where the nerve control of those organs are um, disrupted or um, not working correctly. So it's not just mean just that organ, it could be the nerve connection. And then there's a group of muscle related um, symptoms, which there's muscle pain, muscle like weakness, uh, neuropathy, um, you know, pins and needles, and also joint pain. Um, and then as I mentioned, there's also a propensity for these orthostatic or dysautonomic symptoms, which is uh, dizziness, standing up, or even dizziness when standing. Um, and also uh, uh, more recently, it's recognized that many of the patients have this instability of joints or a hypermobile version of EDS, which is Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And if um, you were to look and see what now was covered under long COVID, these are many of the patient's reports, like any of these symptoms, um, further like highlighting the overlap of these two. And um, so let me go back here for a moment so I can show. Oop. 
no, I'm going, going forward, wrong button, sorry there. I just wanted to go back to that slide before I jump into this one. Um, if you look here again, um, there were different criteria, as I mentioned, at the um, top, the lilac uh, box. If you look further to the right, there was first the Ramsey 1988, um, then became there was a Canadian consensus criteria, which was put out in 2005. And this was followed up by the international consensus criteria in 2011. Now, these were very, um, considering all the symptoms I just reported, what they were trying to do was come up with a way to capture this, to help one, the patient, and also help the provider. And here is the whole uh, overview of this international consensus criteria. Um, now, I thought this is pretty amazing because considering all those symptoms, they actually almost did like early um, machine learning. <laughs> <laughs> to try to capture this. And they did a very good job. Um, so if you look on the, the right, you'll see the items that they have. I know it's very small print. So um, if you could, you know, I, I appreciate that. It might be hard to read. Um, but mostly the first thing that it required was penne. Now this is a little different. It's post-exertional neuroimmune exhaustion. Again, which is shown now that immune sy system is dysfunctional. And this is uh, sort of like a sister of post-exertional malaise. So every patient needed to have that. And importantly, it needed to have a certain amount of time. So 24 hours, a recovery period of 24 hours or longer. And that's sort of to get to start distinguishing, just feeling, okay, you're very tired. Or even if you have an illness and you go out, you overdo it and you do need to rest up, but then you're better, you recover. That's very different than post-exertional malaise and penny because um, post-exertional neuroimmune exhaustion. Um, in that case, what does, it causes um, extreme delimitation and that can even last for weeks or months. And some patients have been sort of like never gone back to their original state. Um, and so they also uh, then described four areas which you needed uh, symptoms from. One, they recognized the neurological um, contribution. So they provided four categories and you needed one symptom from three of these categories. And then in the um, immune, it, then there was the neurological impairment, um, which was uh, also part of this like idea of brain fog. And I think I have a typo there. So, sorry, I repeated that. <laughs> um, and so in this case, uh, you needed, um, let's see, one symptom of the four categories. They also captured immune GI and genourinary um, indications that people were, patients were reporting. And again, they put um, five categories. And in this case, you needed one symptom from three categories. And finally, um, they also mentioned energy production or transport, uh, ion transport. Um, and at the time, there were, were already studies being done, which I haven't covered here in this talk, um, that show that there was clearly um, bio truly biological dysfunction that was occurring. It wasn't just a matter of patients reporting symptoms. There was many great early studies done um, looking at the pathophysiology in this disease. Um, and so again, in this energy category, um, you needed one symptom in any of the ones they recommend uh, mention. Um, and they also rec recognized that there was some people that might be atypical, um, but the, they would at least have um, PEM or penny, and then maybe two or less of these categories. Um, and then that might be somebody that would have the rare example of not having as much pain or maybe uh, sleep issue being absent. Now, the Canadian consensus criteria, which was the precursor to this, and this one, which is the international consensus criteria, are both what are recommended strongly for research. And why is that? Because if you imagine, here's this patient, and you bring them in, there could be a biological basis for these different, what I like to call nodes of, of um, output. You know, so you have your inducing event and that might not cause every, it's not causing everything for everybody. This, it might look like this, but not every patient has all these symptoms. They tend to have a certain node 
of you know diseases symptoms that are going together and that would suggest that that clinical treatment or the treatment for those people all are going to have their own um, you know different approaches based on what they're showing so it's good to think of that and that's why for um, this was developed to sort of emphasize to capture each patient right and very detailed um, and one of the other uh, events in terms of criteria that happened was the National Academy of Medicine convened to come together and sort of decide what could be a very good and useful criteria for uh, pr uh, providers of MECFS. Now, this was uh, a different, I guess, um, ask than showing a research model. So something that providers could be using a clinical criteria, as you could call it. Um, and it might be a little bit low, so I'll read it. So they boiled it down to three components that were absolutely required. One is a substantial reduction or impairment in the ability to engage in pre-illness levels. And that's also, that's lasted six months or more. And that's what's been observed, that people sort of just, as I mentioned, they can't, they get that first infection or event and they just don't feel better. They just can't get better. There are patients though that do get better, but then they relapse. So that suggests that there could be a definite connection with the original event and what it's doing. So the second of, uh, required symptom was post-exertional malaise. As I mentioned again, that is not just exhaustion, you're feeling tired or burnout. That is a very definite um, uh, energy response or deleted energy, if you think of it, to exertion. It could be any kind of exertion. And then the third category, they looked across various studies and they determined that unrefreshing sleep was also sort of characteristic of many, though not all the patients. And then they requested, um, they put in two or of these, um, one of two of the following manifestations. One is cognitive impairment, um, which I mentioned is this idea of brain fog or even memory issues, shortened memory issues. Um, forgetting words, not being able to retrieve words. And the other one was orthostatic intolerance. Now, orthostatic intolerance, again, is a dysautonomic um, symptom in that um, you present with symptoms sort, such as lightheadedness, um, inability to you know, sometimes stand straight. You have like a propensity to faint sometimes. Um, you can have POTS, what's no, known as postural orthostatic tachycardia. Um, when you uh, stand up and your heart rate goes up of higher than 30 beats, there's also neural hypotension where your blood pressure is changing. And there's also maybe in a typical form where those aren't occurring, but you are getting all the other symptoms or orth orthostatic intolerance. Um, they did recognize that, um, and it's in the paper, that their patients can come in with multiple symptoms. Um, I've got some feedback from um, clinicians that were familiar with this, but not familiar that there were other symptoms. So that sort of led them to think maybe if somebody comes in with many more symptoms, they don't have ME. So that might be something maybe to, you know, improve a little or have like that additionally put in this um, uh, diagnostic criteria, because this is what you'll see very much um, reused or put in reviews. Um, so here is just a simple checklist of symptoms. Um, and you'll see coding, as I mentioned, the latest coding for ME-CFS is 90, G93.32. Um, it's under um, neurologic as well. And you'll see the long COVID. Um, this was given first temporarily, U09.9. Um, and if you follow through, I, I, oh, here you can see them. You know, some of I mentioned are fatigue. They both have that. Um, that's required for ME-CFS. Um, they've also, uh, as I mentioned, reported system um, post-exertional malaise. So that's also a required um, symptom. Some of the other things they have in common are headache, sleep disorders, um, impaired um, reasoning, the, the, the neurological function, impaired memory, impaired attention, um, secondary depression. It's important to know that they're not a case of depression. And then the list goes on and you can see, you know, down to here, they're all shared. Now, again, it doesn't mean 
each patient has all these symptoms. It's just that patients have reported similar symptoms. Um, so MassME, um, uh, our community partner, likes to recognize that would, you know, ME is a still a, a disease that's highly impacting people, especially, you know, also in Massachusetts, and to have that recognized. Um, and here, this is not a Taylor Swift friendship bracelet. <laughs> it might look like it. Um, and the, again, those were the symptoms and what they're all connected to different, um, uh, you know, uh, systems that have been found to be uh, dysfunctional um, from direct biological studies. So, you know, obviously with like headache and migraine, it's been observed that there is actually neuroinflammation in patients with ME. Um, I'll just go down a little bit. There's, you know, the, the sense of orthostatic intolerance. They've shown there's problems with directly with the heart and the blood pumping up or hypovolemia. Um, the neuroendocrine system has also been found to be disrupted with cortisol, hypocortisol, in some cases, hypercortisol. Um, and these were actually before, you know, people, you know, actually had identified the biological components. There was recognition, you know, sort of when the patients were reporting this. So these biological studies also have confirmed and pointed to what um, the symptoms could be, why these symptoms could be occurring. Um, and also, for instance, you know, with the um, immune system, they found now, um, you know, there's T cell deficiency, there's T cell exhaustion, a drive towards TH2s, which means um, they're more um, programmed towards, you know, uh, direct uh, responses. So that induces more allergic response, which is also observed in the patients. Um, again, now um, a really uh, new um, and exciting uh, observation for long COVID is that there's continuing reactivation of viruses. So not just SARS-CoV-2, but also viruses that were in there um, in the person, person sorry, um, such as EBV. And that was actually already also discovered with MECFS. Um, and then also um, the autonomic system, as I mentioned, and a area that also has been studied for MECFS is gut dysbiosis. And that overlaps with um, long COVID. So many of these studies that have been done in MECFS, even up to 10, 12, 15 years ago, are also being confirmed for patients with long COVID. And patient, patients with long COVID that are showing signs or criteria of MECFS. So I'm just gonna shift gears a little bit. Um, I just have like five minutes. Um, and I just wanted to go over a little bit of the health and social impact. Um, and I wanted to, again, recognize that all those biological studies, so they're all, you know, available. If you look at PubMed, there's so many and so many great contributions that, you know, I didn't have time to go into in detail. I'd love to in the future. Um, so if you think of what is social determinants of health, you know, I had to sort of, you know, learn to uh, what, the, what these are involved with and how do they impact MECFS? So one is social and economic status, and certainly patients with ME-CFS, all, um, especially with debilitating um, symptoms, will report that they've had to, you know, either decrease, um, they have decreased salary, they're no longer working, or they've had to change where they live. Um, they also can sometimes have not the same access to health care. There is no specialist in MECFS. So what happens is they go from patient doctor to doctor to doctor and sort of not knowing, and also with the lack of knowledge of how the criteria is, they end up sort of in a, you know, in a black hole of care, let's call it that. Um, there's also very limited amounts of education and health literacy on the disease, which also is a factor in social determinants of health. Um, early work is being done now to look at race and ethnicity um, because the research um, support have been so little, this is now just being addressed. And it was a, it's been recognized that for pediatric patients with MECFS, there's a higher prevalence in the Latina, uh, Latinx, or African American um, population. Um, then also, there's gender disparities, right? As I mentioned, the whole history of calling it a hysterical neurologia, right? Um, so many women report it. However, there are men that do get the disease. Um, that needs to be for fully characterized. 
And then also the sense of social support and isolation um, is very high in MECF has patients and they report even a worse um, quality of life than some, you know, uh, cancers that are, uh, um, and, you know, diseases such as MS that can have a profound effect on patients. Um, so this is just a quick uh, comparison of um, ME-CFS versus arthritis. The first one um, looks at number of doctors. Now I did some searching and somewhere I found that there's 200 ME-CFS doctors. I'd like to meet them. <laughs> um, where they are, please. <laughs> Um, but there's, uh, according to this, 5,700 rheumatologists. This was a study I, I looked at. And um, I hope there's more than that, too, for, for people who have uh, rheumatic disease. Um, and the time to diagnosis is also everything. Because what you'll see is for MECFS, there's an average of five years. Some people, it's too, it's hardly, it's very little, too. It's usually like four to seven or something like that. But arthritis, one year you know, to diagnosis. Then there's the number of patients. As I mentioned now, there's um, 10 million patients with MECFS, 54 million actually according to um, CDC with arthritis. But if you look at the patient to doctor ratio, it's completely reverted, right? There's 52,000 patients, uh, one doctor in MECFS. Again, I want to meet them. <laughs> and the arthritis ratio is still not good. It's 9,000 to one. So I think, you know, hopefully we'll encourage more people to go into the health field. Um, but this is just to emphasize that there's clearly are social elements of health that are affected with patients with ME-CFS. And um, this results in health disparities, as I mentioned, delayed diagnosis, inequitable treatment. They have a profound psychological impact and reduced quality of life. So some calls to action could be addressing these, advocating for inclusivity, and having more medical education and training. Um, and so um, uh, this is sort of reiterating what I said, but I wanted to go on to keep uh, track of our time here and introduce the next speaker. So next we're going to have, and thank you for coming here and listening to that first part. We're going to be honored with the presence of Patricia Fennell, um, she's been a very early, you know, dedicated person to this field. Um, she's a scientist, a clinician, um, and an author who specializes in chronic illness, trauma, forensics, and hospice care. Um, she is CEO of Albany Health Management, Inc., um, and an organization that treats and examines global health care concerns through research, consulting, professional education, and tech development, which is a very interesting work going on. Um, she has lectured throughout the United Kingdom, the European Union, Africa and Canada, and here in the US. She's consulted with governments, academics, patient organizations, Fortune 150 companies, health organizations, organization, sorry, <laughs> health organizations such as the CDC and the Walter Reed in areas including um, innovation, restorative justice, and trauma. She's also very well published. Um, some very fantastic textbooks are Managing Chronic Illness, the Fourth Phase Treatment Approach, which she'll discuss today. Um, the Chronic Illness Workbook, which I know really has helped many patients, especially with ME-CFS, um, and the Handbook of the Chronic Fatigue Syndrome. Um, so I wanted to uh, have her come up and um, give her a seminar. Thank you for coming. And I'll, let me set this up here. Thank you. Good morning. Glad to be here. Hi. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> Cast of thousands. Okay. Uh, so let's see. Mike is on, and I just want to make sure I know how to use my tech. So Abdul. Rehearse me? Okay. So um, let me go back. Oh, let me go back here for a second. So I'm going to be introducing to you a model uh, that describes what patients experience, what their care providers experience, what their families experience. Chronic illness is something 
that's its own roller coaster, and we all go on the ride together. So as I'm sharing this with you, wear are all the hats? Think about it from the, if, you're, if you're a provider, if you're a scientist, if you're a patient, if you're a mom, if you're a caregiver, we will all be in many of those roles in any number of chronic illnesses, but certainly for those of us in ME, CFS, and long COVID. Now, oh, am I going the wrong way? I am, okay. So this approach, this approach, uh, well, at this point, we have about 160 hours of curriculum for the approach. And um, as she shared earlier, we've shared it worldwide. But today I'm gonna to focus on the very basic model just to get us started, thinking of this like an introduction. Um, but why even talk about chronic illness? Why talk about MECFS? Why talk about any of these experiences? Why is there such a prevalence of chronic illness worldwide? Well, advances in public health, advances in medical care, and a naturally aging population. We are the first generation of humanity to live this long, the first. Um, in the city I live in now, in Albany, New York, the average lifespan in 1922 was about 53 years. And then with COVID, excuse me, pre-COVID, the average lifespan was about 78, 79 years. It's dropped a little post-COVID, post-acute COVID. Well, that's not evolution, that's public health. That's because we wash our hands and we take antibiotics. We do a variety of things that allows us to live this long. So that would be true for, and I, I guess I'll call the non-MECFS long COVID population, I guess I'll call you know the civilians. Even the civilians are living longer. Everybody's living longer and we are too, but now as chronic illness patients, we are also living longer. We are also living longer. One of the things I've thought about a lot and have written a bit about is to think about groups of chronically ill folks, groups of chronically ill folks. Now, this is just my theoretical thinking about it. Feel free to make up your own, but think about that there's these traditional chronic groups of folks, MS patients, asthma, lupus, diabetes, Crohn's, scleroderma. I could, I could add other traditional chronic schizophrenia, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots of traditional chronic groups of people. And then interestingly, with these acute illness or infection associated patients with lingering symptoms, long-term sequelae, um, cancer patients, it's chronic illness now, cardiovascular disease, certainly MECFS, long COVID, Lyme. So whether it's infection associated or not, but it's acute illness, and then there's this, these long-term sequelae to think about. And then these persistent acutes, people who stay in a very acute state. Now, some of those people do include very severe MECFS patients, but we could also talk about stroke or post-pneumonia, sepsis, PIC patients. And again, the natural consequences of aging in an aging population. So part of my point of this, of, of, of looking at these groups is just saying, we are not one big amorphous mass. And MECFS is not, is not uh, just a satellite. There are these cohorts that can help us in, in our thinking. Now, this is going on while there is this paradigm shift in medicine. In the 20th century, the focus is on acute illness. In the 21st century, the focus is on chronic illness. I used to have a lot of... Um, uh, stat slides and the statistics about chronic illness in general, let alone MECFS, they're changing weekly, uh, bi weekly. I ran across something I was reading last week and it talked about, might have been from World Health, it talked about how seven out of 10 people now are dying from chronic illness that they were living long enough for that to happen. And as MECFS patients, we, if you don't mind me using the royal we, we will be part of that group. So we have this long-term training of, of chronic versus acute care. We have, the, we have this issue. 
but we have this necessity for chronic care models. And we need comprehensive case management and clinical treatment, not versus clinical treatment. So what happens when patients are trying to be seen, are trying to be assessed in this environment where medicine is going through this huge paradigm shift? Chronic illness can be very difficult to define as we know, as we've lived, let alone measure, let alone treat. And medicine has not had the chance to really adapt well to a chronic illness model of care. Patients often fare poorly in acute care settings. Patients' needs vary over the duration and phase of the illness that they're in. We'll talk more about phases in a minute. And patients suffer from social stigma, economic losses, and the lack of knowledge and understanding about their conditions. And everyone becomes frustrated with the unpredictability and the chronicity of the symptoms. The patient does, the family member does, the caregiver does, everybody does. We're not prepared for this. Um, as a patient said to me, I was treating this very lovely uh, Mormon family about 25 years ago. And it might have been one of the, the parents of the young couple said, this was for better, this was for better or for worse, but not chronic illness. So here's another way I think about it. Traditional disability versus chronic conditions. We think of, I think of traditional disability as hearing impairment, visual impairment. Maybe you're in a wheelchair. Maybe you're a vet, maybe you've had any, but, but your condition is more or less static. It's more or less fixed. And then we have these dynamic conditions. So any, any ME-CFS patient, again, depending on the severity of their condition, um, they can have good days, they can have bad days. They can have good hours, they can have bad hours. So there's waxing and waning of the symptoms within a framework of relapse and remission. These two situations, the static versus chronic, can occur at the same time. You can be a vet in a wheelchair with MECFS, and some of your symptoms ebb and flow, and some don't. But traditionally, we have thought of disability, and I would certainly argue as MECFS patients, and I carry that diagnosis among many others, that I can be disabled, my symptoms can ebb and flow on any given day, and nothing says that I can't also have a fixed disability, like my very terrible vision, just saying. And we have these legal definitions of disability and chronic, il chronic illness. And the legal definitions vis-a-vis -vis ME, CFS, are, of course, predicated on, based on a lot of the work that HALA just showed us. What are the current uh, federal definitions? What are the current world definition? There was the FDUCA definition, and then the Canadian definition, and the world, et cetera. And the law looks at all of that in an effort to say, what does this mean? This is all still being very much defined. And then we have the social or the colloquial definitions. There's a legal definition of disability, but there's a colloquial one. And illness is, is an, it's an ancient term. It's certainly a Victorian term. And we have disease, and we have condition, and we have syndrome. This is how our condition is discussed. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the phases, but before I do, I want to talk to you a little bit about our philosophy of this phase approach that we take. And we don't have the time to discuss all of that, but I'm going to pick out a couple of them. Um, we definitely take a systems approach. We think of the patient the way that I think of Russian nesting dolls, that we have an individual. We have with systems within the individual, and that individual is in a family or a friend group or within their community. And that also then encompasses the country that they live in and their care providers, that there's multiple levels within which the person 
is experiencing their illness. And we have these false dichotomies in care that you're either sick or well, that you're disabled or you're not, that you, you can, can you be a patient and a clinician? Can you be a patient and a provider? The phenomena of chronicity that we've already discussed, which is really, again, given how long we're living and the advances in medical care, that we live long enough to be chronically ill, to have these variety of things happen over time. What I want to focus on a little bit is traumatization and chronicity. Now, I argue that the disease experience is traumatic in and of itself, in and of itself. If you, you might be somebody who also had a trauma history, maybe you are a sex abuse survivor, maybe there was violence in your family, but statistically high likelihood, no, not necessarily at all. That could be part of your history, but the disease process is traumatic in and of itself. It's very traumatic to lose your ability to work, to lose your ability to go to school, to lose your ability to socialize, to lose your ability to walk. That's traumatic in and of itself. Now, I also think about iatrogenic trauma. This is when someone seeks medical care and in the seeking of care, or any care, in the seeking of care, Trauma can ha happen in that regard. Now, I like to think I have never traumatized a patient by misspeaking or not understanding or saying the wrong thing, but I've done this for so long, the likelihood is that I may have. Similarly, a long time ago in the 80s, my appendix burst during my hospice internship, and it took about a week for everybody to figure it out, for all of us to figure it out. And while I was in the hospital, I contracted additional infections. That's itrogenic illness, but also potentially traumatizing. So the disease process, ME-CFS can be traumatic in and of itself, just going through the experience. And then the care providers can nine times out of 10, at least unintentionally, can also, it can be a traumatic experience. Hala spoke earlier about the yuppie flu. I remember the yuppie flu. I remember that designation. I remember that um, epithet. And essentially, as I understood it, the assumption was that the majority of the people who were ill were um, professional class, white women who were trying to have it all and it was, as a result, got exactly what they deserved. And that's the yuppie flu. And then research started to happen. I remember uh, an old colleague of mine, Jason, I believe he was one of the people who did research looking at who actually meets this criteria. And one of the highest populations was, was women of color. But there can be cultural traumatization in terms of how folks are regarded. And then the people around the patient can be vicariously traumatized. I go back to that Mormon family I mentioned earlier. Young man, very ill, young engineer. Young woman, three kids. Her parents wondering why she had picked so poorly. How could she have picked so poorly? Traumatic for her, traumatic for him. And all sets of parents, vicariously traumatized by the whole situation. Now, there can be premorbidities and comorbidities, like I said at the beginning. You can come into any of this with your own trauma history. But it's very important to remember that being ill and being ill repeatedly and having the opportunity to interact with the medical community over and over and over and over again, because again, you're chronically ill, there's more opportunities for traumatization to occur. So I want to talk to you a little bit about chronic care and context and culture. Um, the healthcare system within which this care is provided. Now I alluded to this earlier, what was the healthcare system in the last century? What's the current healthcare system? And we're trying to take care of very sick people um, who are 
sick and or disabled, if we will, over time within our current healthcare system. Well, our current healthcare system is having a bit of a struggle. It is definitely having a bit of a struggle. And how much it's struggling has a lot to do with what zip code you're in, um, what country you're in, how much money you have, are you insured, are you not insured? These are all the variables that go into your healthcare system. Now the average physician, this was pre-COVID, the average physician in the United States had somewhere between nine and 14 minutes to spend with a patient, which makes it very hard for that, pay, for that physician or nurse practitioner, whoever the primary care provider is, makes it very hard for them to even begin to listen to what's going on. Now we have these different levels of discourse wherein we talk about the patients. Some of them are professional, very professional are, you know, the publications that we have and how we talk to each other. And then, then there's how we talk about the patients, you know, down in the cafeteria, that level of discourse, this more social level of discourse. And how do we talk about them in media? And all of these different levels impact how that patient is treated. So it can easily be argued that it's just as important uh, what is said on social media about a patient or about a condition or about a level of care as it is in any professional publication. So within that conversation, I want us to think a little bit about these social cultural factors Again, this is my list. We've written a lot about. Uh, feel free to consider your own. But these are the ones that are, have always sung out to me. We have a cultural intolerance of suffering. We have a cultural intolerance for grief. We are pull yourself up by your bootstraps culture. This is how we think. This is how we go, go forward. Extremely in, in, individualistic. I was doing some training, some supervision at a large agency some years back. And one of the senior supervisors, been married about 25 years at that point, and her husband suddenly died. And she was given about a week and a day and a half day off. Wow. That's pretty impressive. All that grieving is supposed to get done in that much time. I particularly like the half day. I didn't quite understand what that was about. But again, we have this cultural intolerance of suffering. We have a cultural intolerance of ambiguity. We don't like the unknowable. We like our diseases the way Sister Frances Eustace taught me to write papers with a very distinct beginning, middle, and end. This is how we like our illnesses to go. And the media, just jumping down to five, um, reflects that. We like our illnesses, you know, they have to fit within a paradigm of either about 27 minutes of media, if it's broadcast, or 40 some odd minutes, and the person's supposed to get ill, and look very good doing it, by the way, get ill, get treated, improve, or on some occasions die, and we're done, we're out. And not what happens to the MECFS chronically ill patient, where they're well, they're a little bit better, they return to their baseline, they do, they don't, it's back and forth and back and forth, over and over again, over and over again. There's no framework for that. We're building one now. And finally, in these factors, Syndromes have initial illegitimacy, and then legitimacy is built over time. The syndromes, MECFS, becomes enculturated over time. In the early 80s, when I was first cutting my teeth clinically, I treated these very lovely women from Britain um, who had uh, been diagnosed with MS in the 50s. And they were electroshocked for treatment and it didn't go well. And trying to get them to go and be seen was difficult. They were very afraid, traumatized, etc. What they also couldn't believe, and I've had these conversations now with 
MECFS people I have taken care of, work with their families over the decades off and on, is that now MS, this is a very, this is, this is a legitimate uh, disorder. It's not considered to be hysteria. And I'm watching MECFS go through the same process of slow enculturation. Language gets built, definitions get built, colloquial understandings gets, bu gets built. Spending money on it really helps too. So I'm gonna to introduce to you these phases, these four phases, and I'm just gonna ask for a time check. Hey, Ella, how am I doing on time? How much do I got? So, ooh, okay. So wonderful. So I'm gonna tell you this story about Jesse. Now, once again, I'd like to remind you of what I said in the beginning. Um, think about this from Jesse's perspective. Think about it from her parents' perspective or his parents or their parents' perspective. Think about it, you're the scientist and you're Jesse and this is what you're going through. Or you're the provider caring for Jesse. You're the physician caring for Jesse. Or you're the spouse. Or you're the child of Jesse. Try on all the hats. Now, there's Jesse. There she is, or he is, or they are up there. There's Jesse. Jesse is going to go through these four phases crisis, stabilization, resolution, and integration. And at each one of these phases, I'm going to introduce to you these three domains that she and those around her are experiencing. See, there's her friends, family, physician, clinician up there. And um, we're going to talk about what Jesse goes through in the physical domain, what they go through in the psychological domain, and what they go through in the social interactive domain. And for the sake of this discussion, um, I'm going to make uh, Jesse a cis woman. Maybe she's in her 30s. Maybe she has a couple kids. Maybe she's working. She's married. But the marriage is a little rocky. They've been having financial difficulties. Um, where does she work? Again, well, uh, let's say she works part-time, regardless of where she works. So in phase one, physically, behaviorally, Jessie's been noticing that if she climbs a flight of stairs, she has trouble climbing the next flight of stairs. And she's been noticing that when she parks in the work parking lot, it's harder to get into the building. And she's noticing that she's having difficulty remembering where she parked that car. And she's noticing that when she's through with work, she's exhausted. And she's noticing that when she wakes up in the morning, she's still exhausted, if she sleeps at all. She's noticing a lot of things, but she's coping with her symptoms. And she's clearly in an onset stage within phases, um, but it's getting more acute. And she finds that one morning, um, she's supposed to go to a meeting and she just can't get herself out of bed. And she's panicking and she's really now in an emergency experience. So she gets herself to her physician, to her clinician. Now, what is she psychologically going through in this phase? Well, as this unfolds, and this can take months to unfold, some of the initial research on this some years ago, in the United States, a crisis phase, again, it depends where you are, what zip code you're in, et cetera, et cetera, um, it can take an easy 18 months if you're in a country that has um, uh, universal medicine it could take less time depends where you are but at some point 
Jesse hits a wall and she gets to her physician and the wrestling with what's going on begins. So she's experiencing this loss of psychological control. What's going on? My body isn't making sense. I used to be able to do this and now I can't. I used to be able to do this and it's just getting worse and I don't know why. And there's ego loss in this. She's ashamed. She can become very ashamed. She can feel self-hatred. I had a young woman in just this state texting me while I was driving over yesterday. She could not get out of bed. And the, what she, she's, she's beyond exhausted. She's in pain. But the amount of shame that she's feeling and the self-hatred that she's articulating goes on long enough. Some patients, they, they, they try to dissociate from it as best they can. And it's not unusual for people in the crisis phase, especially if it's going on for a bit, to become fearful of others. Are they going to reject me? Have they rejected me? Do they believe me? They learn to isolate. They can have mood swings. Is, is it safe? Is it not? While their body is going through all these changes. Now, what's going on with those around them, socially, interactively? I'm going to go back to that Mormon family. Others around Jesse can experience shock. This can't be true. My child, my, my child, uh, Hala referenced earlier, can't brush, can't brush her teeth. This doesn't make sense. Can't get out of bed. I, I don't understand. And it can be met, met with disbelief. No, no, this is going to get better. We're going to find an answer. You just have to get up. And in some cases, and I've seen this, there's revulsion. Oh, my goodness. This is terrifying. I don't want to be around this. Those around can become vicariously traumatized. Clinicians I worked with uh, 20 years ago in MECFS, they might have been told by some of their supervisors, don't want you seeing those patients. They take too much time. Believed or not. Now, how well Jessie and those around her, her family, her friends, and however you define family, how well they survive the crisis phase has an awful lot to do with the maturation of that family, of that friend group. Did she have a lot of good friends? Were there people who were already supportive of her in general? What is the general state of her marriage? What is the general state of her job? This makes a huge difference in terms of, does she have health care? Does she have a provider that she likes, who she trusts? And what we find happens in this crisis phase is that people begin to sort of line up on this suspicion support continuum. Very supportive, very believing, understanding. And then those are like, oh, I don't know. This doesn't. You know, Jessie, she always, she always was a bit of a crybaby, wasn't she? I mean, now when you think about it, a bit of a whiner, a little dramatic. Phase one. Phase two. Phase two. Stabilization, sometimes normalization failure. Let me be perfectly clear. In phase two, Jessie isn't better. She's not better. And let me also address this. Why phases versus stages? Stages imply we do it, it's done. We do it, it's done. Phases allow us mobility. And in any given lifetime with chronic illness, and certainly with MECFS, if you get through the phases once, now you have a cognitive map. Now you have a way of thinking about, oh, this is how this goes. Oh, I've been through this before. This is navigable. This makes a degree of sense to me and to others. So when you go through it again, because with MECFS, you can get diagnosed with additional things. You can have MECFS and then be diagnosed with cancer. None of these things are mutually exclusive. You can have MECFS and then your spouse can suddenly die. You can be thrown back into the crisis phase. Thus, phases versus stages. So in phase two, she's 
She's not cured. She's not better. But she's beginning to carve order out of chaos. This is beginning to make a degree of sense. So physically, behaviorally, again, not better, but she's plateaued maybe, stabilized maybe. Now, this is a very tricky time when a patient has been in crisis for so long and they've started to stabilize. And a variety of things occur. There's this increased caution from secondary wounding, taking that from the trauma literature. Jessie's a bright girl. She's figured out there's people she can talk to about this and people she can't if she wants to avoid further stigmatization. There's clinicians that get it, as she puts it colloquially, and physicians that don't. So she withdraws from some situations, from that particular aunt or uncle at a holiday gathering that says, aren't you back at work yet? She begins to navigate that. But she also does social searching. We search for others of like kind. We search for people who share our experience. We search for our group. We search for our people. Now, not all groups are created equal, and not all others of like kind are necessarily good. When we did, you know, the others of like kind in the groups of South Central in Los Angeles, it's a high price to pay for being part of a group. Breast cancer groups? Ah, there, there's a lot, there's a lot more com com camaraderie, understanding, and a shared experience. So we search for others of like kind. Now, in this experience, there's service confusion. Maybe the clinician that you see has a bit of an understanding about MECFS, or if they don't, they're open to learning. They're open to, they're, they're curious. But patients also have to search for those who can actually treat them. Now, Clinicians might get annoyed at that, and we might call that doctor hopping. Or this, this is a non-compliant patient. Maybe. Maybe I'm not the right provider. And then there's also internal boundary confusion. Am I a person with a disease or a disease with a person? How does this work? Who am I now? I used to be a mom who could get up and make lunches. I haven't made a lunch in a year and a half. I can't, I, you know, I throw cereal at them. That's as good as it gets. Socially interactively, it's a very interesting time because there can be increased conflict or cooperation. This can be one of the time when marriages fail, kids have had enough with, of their sick mother, the mother's had enough of the sick child, or there can be increased cooperation. This is where the person said, I signed up for better or worse, not for chronically ill. This wasn't part of the plan. And again, those around are, are looking at vicarious secondary wounding. Relationships are ending. And that brings traumatization. Now, maybe Jessie is stabilized enough that she's trying desperately to be her pre-crisis self. But she is an MECFS patient, which isn't to say that there aren't MECFS patients who do uh, have a degree of recovery. But this is why I want to go back here for one second. Patients get caught on a loop of crisis and stabilization between phase one and phase two. They crisis, they stabilize, they achieve a degree of their pre-crisis life and they think, oh good, I'm back. And often this is where patients after a week, a month, several months, a year, they will crash again. And it's brutal. It's a brutal experience. But it's a very common experience because everybody is cheerleading, and I understand why, that no, you've, you, you've recovered and we can be who we used to be. But as the man wrote, you can't go home again. We're going forward. You know, even if anything I've been diagnosed with or anything I've experienced personally could be cured tomorrow, I still have all those experiences. 
And nothing's going to undo my terrible, soft Irish teeth. <laughs> Nothing. So even if I was cured, there are still all these pieces that I carry forward in my experience. So let's say stabilization has occurred and there are changes in Jessie's home life. There are changes in her work life. She's making an attempt to see if she can work part-time. She's gotten a diagnosis. She's got a clinician who more or less understands what's going on, but is patient with her, patient with the situation. Here's where you're moving to the resolution phase. Now, what Jesse's been learning is that, um, again, she's not cured. She has this chronic experience and she's going to, but it's become increasingly more integrated into her life. It's making more sense to her. She's carved order out of chaos. She's developed some new attitudes, some new norms, some new ways to think about who she is and how to live this way now. So could an emergency stage happen again? Absolutely. Could she have a diminishment? Could she be getting worse over time because she is aging? Yeah, or she could have an improvement. She could have a continued plateau, or she could have a full-blown relapse. All of those things are possible. But now she understands this as part of a map, part of a process. Psychologically, there's a lot going on here in the resolution phase. This is where we meet the dark night of the soul. This is where a lot of patients, I mean, have certainly said to me over the years, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. I don't know if I can do this. And this kind of an appropriate grief reaction needs to be assisted and needs to be met with compassion and to teach the patient and the family how to, make, how to meet that suffering with compassion. Not for the hopes of the time at the end of the tunnel, but for the actual time in the tunnel. Now, in this process, several things happen. Jessie begins to, as she's recognizing, definitely she's not going home again, but she cherry picks the past. There are parts of that pre-crisis self that she can bring into the future. And she experiments, if she can, with some new roles, maybe a new identity experimentation, some people, a small percentage, become activists, become advocates, but that's not for everybody. And that wasn't for Jesse. For her, it was, I'm gonna see if they'll let me work part-time. I'm gonna make some new friends. I'm gonna join this group. And part of what we see happens as this compassionate response to the suffering is occurred, is allowed, is this returning locus of control. We'll talk more about that in a second. And certainly this, this increased awareness of societal effects. What's the media saying about me this week? What's the media saying about long COVID this week or MECFS this week? Is it up, is it down, is it good, is it bad? And for some people this includes, however they want to define it, a spiritual development. Again, you have to be willing to understand when you're working with people that this is a very appropriate place for people. This is the existential crisis. This is where people say, why me? God, what did I do? And why should I continue to do this? And why would I choose life? Now, I haven't seen anybody go through this who hasn't found a way for it to make, to make meaning about it. They have to understand why are we going through this journey? Why bother? For many people, that's part of a creative process or a political process or this personal internal transformation that's much more quiet, but still extremely significant. We have to be able to tell that story about ourselves. Why was I there and why am I here now and why should I go forward? Now, socially interactively, part of what Jessie's doing is she may also be breaking the silence. This is who I am. I don't have to educate everybody about it. Take it or leave it. And she recognizes the stigma that exists. 
You know, for a lot of people, Jesse was one of them. She had never been a minority before. You know, she was, she was a, a young white woman who had gone to a good school and then gone to an Ivy, very, very lucky. Um, but now she's part of a minority. Now she's part of a stigmatized group, quite the education. Sometimes this requires confrontation. She's got to tell the uncle at Thanksgiving, Uncle Bob, stop asking me about what I'm doing. She learns about boundaries. She experiments with new roles, some social, some vocational. And this is also where people who left in the second phase or in the first phase can come back. People get reintegrated. But I've never seen anybody who's gone through this journey who hasn't lost at least one person. I'm not, I, at least one. It's part of the deal. Now, in the integration phase, again, a, a true understanding that this is an ongoing process. A person can be in recovery, they can be in plateau, they can be improvement, they can be in relapse. On it goes. On it goes. Psychologically, we see this role in identity integration. When in the first phase, she was saying, am I a person with a disease or a disease with a person? What am I? Now, it's like, oh, yes, this is part of my experience. This is one of the things I am. And so now there's a new personal best. What does it look like? This is a heck of a transition. It requires accepting disability. It requires accepting difference. It requires learning how to play a poor hand well. It's hard, this is very hard work. This is not for the faint of heart. But again, new reintegrated supporters, maybe an alternative vocation, maybe alternative activities, but these are the possibilities. So those are the phases. Now, let's talk a little bit about those social cultural factors again. I'm just gonna pick out a couple. So this is part of what Jesse's going through, those four, those four phases, right? And here's what's going on around her. The dynamics of suffering, the social clinical controversy. Is it real? Is it all in your head? Are you malingering? Remember that term? I loved that, malingering, that was fun. Um, we have clinical controversy and we have Pressure for non-disclosure. When I first started doing this work, first started standing at a podium and talking, first time I stood at a podium and talked about CFS was in 1992. And in those years, you could not be a patient and a scientist. You could not be a patient and a clinician. You could be one or the other, one of those false dichotomies. But then, that was, when, that was right around when all the work around the AIDS patients, and it was years, of course, before Me Too, and years before, um, before we had terms like intersectionality. So there's a lot of pressure for non-disclosure. I was passing. In certain settings, I was passing for well and doing a hell of a job, and it was necessary. And you get negative reporting, negative reinforcement for genuine reporting. Oh, it's not that bad. Be positive. And there's an attitude conveyed of characterological inferiority. I had given one of these talks, and I was, I don't know where I was. I was somewhere in the U.S., and uh, a, a rather renowned clinician came up to me after I shared a bit and said, you have this? I thought you had your, your act together. Ooh. And I'm glad that person wasn't one of my healthcare providers because that would have been an itrogenic healthcare experience. So what's the effect of that? Part of what can happen for Jesse is that she avoids intimacy, that she has to pass. Current language would be code switch. Some people need anodynes, all different kinds of addiction to get through. And that's just, you know, how do they get through this? But part of what they learn 
is there can be social abandonment and rejection and social contract violation. If you work real hard and tell the truth, is everything gonna be okay? That's what I was taught. Depends. We have an intolerance of ambiguity. Again, we do not like the unknown. We do not like the unknowable. As I said previously, we like our diseases extremely well-defined. And if they're not, oh, we're, we're not comfy. So what happens? What's the dynamic? The contagion. Uh-oh. I don't want to work with that group of patients because they're going to think, you know, they're not going to think as highly of my work. I was advised 25, 30 years ago when I started writing and doing research by um, a senior publisher that I really didn't, did I really want to do, my, do any of my career in this, in this patient population because it would really hurt my career. So that kind of fear is transferred. This is part of what Jesse experiences. And all of this unknown ideology, all of this, this what's the prognosis? We don't know. You're going to get well? Don't know. And this, this just world assumption, which is not unheard of, this just world assumption. Because, you know, if you're sick, what did you do wrong? You're still sick? What did you do wrong? Did you eat the wrong things? Did you overexercise? Did you try to have it all and get exactly what you deserved? And Jessie perceives herself as a burden. She doesn't want to be a burden. Now, what's the effect of this? This generalized guilt, grief, depression. So this cultural climate, what is that cultural climate, which is very impacted by the media? So what happens in the media? Patients can be scapegoated. They're offered up for public ridicule and also support, depends where you are. But good or bad, you are being judged all the time. And a public assignment of role and worth. So what's the effect for Jessie and her family? Loss of privacy, increased fear, anxiety, isolation, grief, a decreased sense of worth. Happens to a lot of minorities. So this is that climate. So a pre-sentiment of suspicion is conveyed. Negative personality characteristics can be inside. And the patient can be perceived as damaged. Now, from the outside, be it the clinician, but this is from the perspective of the clinician. What does Jesse look like from the outside? Phase one, think back to phase one. Think what, what she was going through. What's wrong? I don't know. She presents with diagnostic and treatment urgency. Fix me and fix me now. You have the power. I don't. You're the clinician. I don't have it. The locus of control is outside of Jesse in her perception at that time and the people around her. This invites increased self-pathologizing. For some, increased intrusion or denial. So for Jesse, oh my God, are people looking at me? I was working with this very lovely woman who many years ago, uh, senior publishing in New York. Her level of, <laughs> I still hear from her from time to time, her level of denial is fascinating. They had to lead her out of the building, take her keys away from her. You can't do this job anymore. Oh, no, I'll be fine. For most people, it's the increased intrusion. And if Jesse wasn't thrilled with the unknowable before, she's really not thrilled with it now. Increased, decreased tolerance of ambiguity. In phase two, remember, she's carving order out of chaos. So this locus of control is beginning to return to the self. And she's seeking others of like kind. Treatment, support, identification. She has a decreased, but her tolerance for the idea of anything chronic, forget it. It's not unusual for people to be referred to us, to my group, and they want to get at it, they want to do it. 
and they stabilize and we're done, we're fixed. And it's like, okay. And if you need me, we'll hear from you in about a year, usually. Decreased self-pathologizing though. She's still scared to death, but maybe she's not so bad. This is where the group of like kind come in real handy. And three, now remember, this was the dark night of the soul, but is she getting help meeting it with compassion and appreciation? And by the way, nobody gets to phase three without help. I don't care if it's your rabbi, your best friend, sorry, your wife, your social worker, but you don't do it alone. So this increased awareness of societal effects. Yeah, I gotta be careful who I talk to, where, when, and how. Yeah, I mean, if we have a candidate who is standing at a podium and ridiculing the disabled, that's a very clear message about what's safe and am I safe wherever I am. So this increased inter internalization of locus of control though, increasingly in phase three, what Jesse is feeling is, you know what? I kind of know what's going on. I may not have the fancy names for it, but I know if I, I can climb three flights of stairs, I can't climb four flights of stairs. I know if I look at screens for this long, I'm gonna be this tired. I know she's beginning to understand what her parameters are. And her increased expression of self-compassion. She under, begins to understand that she's worthy regardless. She's constructing her own chronic illness experience. She's creating the narrative. She's taking it back. And it continues, this integration of this pre and post crisis self and this reconstructed definition of self some of the old, some of the new, we constructed cultural role in relationships. Um, should I end? I think maybe. All right, so I'm going to just to go here. So wait, wait, hang on. So there would be more, but let me just go here to the end if you want to Go here, sorry, 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 almost there. This is some of the teaching stuff. Okay. If you want to talk with us, here's where you can reach us. And thank you. I'll just read from it. So we have um, oh. Okay. oh, wonderful talk. And thank you so much for sharing your personal um, story there. That's very moving. Um, thank you again for coming today. Uh, we've also had um, people watching online, um, which is great. Thank you all online for joining. Um, one question is, um, in your experience, what is the best way to get someone who is in the I can't do this anymore stage through the, this phase? Um, I'm going to assume that I can't do it any more stages. I want to give up. Well, um, it's something I talk about with patients just about at least somebody a couple of times a week. And part of it is... I was talking to a young woman uh, yesterday. Actually, I was talking to a couple of young women yesterday. And part of what I share with them, and by young, I mean like she's in her 40s. And part of what I share with them is that we live in a time, thanks to AI, thanks to social media, thanks to, unfortunately, long COVID, we live in a time where the amount of research that's being done, the amount of theory development that's being done, the amount of uh, paradigms that are being developed, that there's reason to stay the course because there's going to be more options 
for change, more options for treatment, more options for understanding. There's reason to be optimistic, even in the darkest times. Now that may, you know, what we do to support ourselves um, in uh, the minute, in the hour, in the day, some of it is you keep it in a day. How do I get from today to tomorrow? And do it compassionately and with care and talking to the right people, getting the right support. You deserve to be here. Um, that's a very good message to give people to keep hope. Um, that might yeah, be the, the I think there's step. more reason now to be hopeful than there ever has been in the, the 40 years I've been doing this. Yeah. And that, that goes for many um, of the chronic conditions. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Um, just one more question from um, the online group, and then we'll open it up to people here. Um, one question is redefining parameters of what can do resonated with them. Do you see a role for functional medicine and whole patient approaches to get to that stage? I didn't hear the first part of the question. Um, th I think they were just complimenting, <laughs> saying oh. that redefining parameters of what can what one can do very resonated with them. Oh, okay, good. And the question is, do you see a role for functional medicine and whole patient approaches to get to that stage? I see, I see a role for functional medicine. I see a role for traditional medicine. I see a role for every discipline and every approach. We need more paradigms. We need more approaches. Um, I personally am more uh, attuned to and familiar with evidence-based but I also recognize that we have to um, have the opportunity to create the evidence, to create the research, if that answers the question. Uh, uh, certainly, there's a role. Um, is there somebody else that would like to ask a question here? Um, Heather, do you want to? She'll ask you. Uh, thank you for that fantastic talk. I am one of probably uh, thousands of people who have benefited from your chronic illness workbook. Thank you. And I know that um, you don't have time to talk about everything that you described there, but there, there's an element of the recovery and of finding a new normal that you didn't really touch on. And I wonder if you could say a few words about finding creative outlets Yes, yes. Um, next time, when we have more time, I'll talk about how do we assess and treat at each phase. And so part of that in that um, to help people get from phase two to phase three, that's where the creative outlet comes in. And that creative outlet can include, again, a political approach, an activist approach. Uh, there are those who write musicians. There's a lot of ways to find expression for the suffering and to find expression for new roles and expansion. The act of staying the course, the act of creating this new narrative, this at, this at, the act of creating meaning is a, is a huge creative endeavor in and of itself. And the activities, be they the arts or political or social, they become um, a tool for that process. And they also can become an outcome. Thanks. Anybody else? Nope. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Patricia, for that wonderful um, talk. It was very moving, and we appreciate your personal input. Um, we're going to just take um, a five-minute break um, uh, before we have uh, the next speakers will be remote, actually, and they'll be joining us. Um, so if you want to come back um, and, like, five up, and then we'll get um, started again. Thank you. Um, welcome back, everybody. Um, and I wanted to thank again Patricia Fennell for her wonderful talk. Um, she did put up her contact information. Um, and uh, if you can't, you can um, also reach me, hala.slus at umassmed.edu.
Um, so the next um, talk is going to be about uh, addressing this issue of post-exertional malaise. Um, and as I mentioned, um, that was a very important um, requirement for the diagnostic criteria in ME-CFS, ME originally and CFS later. Um, so we will have both um, Stacy St Stevens and Todd Davenport giving a talk called Unmasking PEM, Assessing Disability and Its Pathophysiology Using a Two-Day Cardiopulmonary Exercise Test. Now, this was very groundbreaking. Um, in fact, when I had uh, my family member and I did not understand what was going on, I remember coming across one of their papers and a light bulb went off. Like, this is exactly what they're experiencing. They'll do one activity and then they try to do it again. And, it, it, you know, they can't. It's as if they ran a marathon. Um, and uh, just to make sure we didn't run into any more um, <laughs> issues, they actually kindly made a video to share so we wouldn't have to coordinate having the two of them on and um, speaking. So first we'll go to their video and then they will join us live for some questions and answers. First, let me give you a little background about Stacy Stevens. Um, sorry for the typo there. Um, she holds a bachelor degree in sports medicine and a master's degree in exercise physiology. She's the founder of the Wardwell Foundation, which was this um, very groundbreaking um, idea of using a two-day CPT test. Um, her research team pioneered this, um, and she's shown the hallmark of clinical features of the illness, post-exertional malaise. Um, in 2022, the International Association for Chronic Fatigue Syndrome, ME, awarded Ms. Stevens the Innovators Prize um, for her innovation in this um, area of ME-CFS. Um, the testing paradigm is now being used to evaluate people with long COVID to document disability, post-exertional malaise, and guide rehabilitation programs. Um, and this is not one thing that I was able to mention about um, social disparities for patients, but they often are denied disability um, requests, having to go twice or three times and sometimes never receiving it. Um, she has served on the Department of Health and Human Services Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Advisory Committee. She was also vice president of IAC FSME one point. Her past and current re research collaborations include the University of British Columbia, Cornell University, Stanford University, and the NIH. Her clinical experience includes utilizing CPET for disability evaluation and management programs. Next, we'll have Todd Davenport, who's um, a professor and chair in the Department of Physical Therapy at the University of Pacific in California. Now, he's earned several degrees, so he first earned his bachelor's degree in psychology and exercise science and sports medicine. Um, then he went on to have a doctor of physical therapy um, from the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. And then he also has a master's of public health um, from the University of California at Berkeley um, and a doctor of philosophy in health, exercise and sports science at the University of Sports, Portsmouth in the United Kingdom. And there'll be a, a quiz later <laughs> about all his degrees. You can't leave until you answer it. Dr. Dr. Davenport is a scientific advisor to the Workwell Foundation and chair of Long COVID Physio. His research involves the system level physiology and clinical recognition of post-exertional malaise, post-exertional neuroimmune exhaustion, as I mentioned earlier, in myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, and long COVID. And here's their video. All right, it looks like we are recording. Fantastic. Hi, I'm Stacy Stevens, and I'm the founder of Workwell Foundation. Thank you so much for having Todd and myself for this wonderful uh, session. Hopefully, we'll all be learning more about um, MECFS and infection-associated chronic conditions. So the topic for today is unmasking post-exertional malaise. And this has been the focus of our research for the last 25 years. And we've done this using cardiopulmonary exercise testing, and we've adopted a two-day test paradigm. 
to help us assess disability and its underlying pathophysiology. We started in the 90s with a clinical trial for the first drug for the treatment of chronic fatigue syndrome. And what they wanted to use as their outcome measure was treadmill duration for the study. And I said, you know what? In order to do this safely, we have to at minimum do a stress test. And what I really would like to do is a cardiopulmonary exercise test because then you have all the physiological data to pair with that treadmill duration. And so what is a cardiopulmonary exercise test? Why did we want to do that all those years ago? Go ahead and advance the next slide, Todd. So a cardiopulmonary exercise test allows the measurement of gas exchange. And what that means is you get a non-invasive diagnostic procedure that involves several systems. You get a peek at the heart, the lungs, and metabolism at rest and during exercise stress. Next slide. The American Heart Association says that this is the gold standard for aerobic exercise tolerance assessment. Uh, my professional association is the American College of Sports Medicine. Uh, we have guidelines for exercise testing and prescription, which is a textbook. It has a companion resource manual. This test has been around for more than 50 years. Every exercise physiology 101 student has a lab on cardiopulmonary exercise testing. It's valid. It's reliable. It is reproducible. And it is the go-to for not only our field in exercise science, but for many other fields. Now, why hasn't everybody heard about this? And I think this article is beautiful. The title is Cardiopulmonary Exercise Testing Relevant but Underused. And, and that is the story of this test is it is still highly relevant, but very underutilized. The quote here that I love is that discrepancies in application are compounded by patterns in which this test is administered and interpreted by cardiology, pulmonology, or exercise specialists who limit their assessments to the priorities of their own disciplines and miss these huge opportunities to distinguish symptom origins. And so cardiologists look at the heart, very focused on that. Pulmonologists look at the lungs. Exercise scientists look at function. Instead of integrating these and, and looking to see what is causing these symptom origins. And that is the beauty of this test. So I think one of the things that is so complicated is there's so many things that can be done with it. From a research perspective, there's the opportunity for diagnosis and diagnostic subsets. The test is also used frequently as an outcome measure in heart disease, lung disease, cancer. Next slide. So we have the research utility, but we also have the clinical utility in which this test can be used to evaluate post-exertional malaise, the hallmark feature of MECFS. Uh, it's highly prevalent in long COVID and other infection-associated illnesses. How do we quantify that? How do we measure it? CPET gives us a standardized stressor to do just that. And then in terms of looking at oxygen consumption, we can relate that to an impairment category that tells us how disabled this person is and assigns them to a functional impairment category, which then guides the clinician to telling the patient why they can or can't do certain activities, what is the limiting factor, and how to better manage their condition. What are the uses for this test? I mentioned it, it as a diagnostic tool. There are over 50 conditions that have CPET-specific profiles, or a CPET signature, if you will, that can be used for diagnosis. 
of heart disease, vascular disease, metabolic disorders, on and on it goes. It's, it's very elegant. I mentioned a disability evaluation tool. Social security, long-term disability can be obtained. They require objective evidence. And when we're not doing research, our lab is doing disability evaluations to quantify functional impairment. At any given time, if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, you'll see that CPET is being currently used as an outcome measure and has been for several decades in two to 300 different clinical trials, which is amazing. Everything from cancer to heart disease to pulmonary disease, all sorts of clinical trials are using this to objectively quantify if an intervention is working. And we have been advocating for 20 years that this should be used in our field. Uh, Todd was just presenting last week uh, at a long COVID symposium and, and they were bemoaning the fact that there are so few objective measures. There's no objective diagnostic test. There are very few objective outcome measures and this is tried and true. It has been around forever. And then in my field, of course, fitness assessment and exercise prescriptions are, are other uses. So you can see that this is like a multi multimodal tool uh, that, that I think people kind of get lost because the utility is so fantastic. So what, what do you get? What does it show? I think we get a number of very specific outcomes from the test including VO2 max, your total aerobic capacity. It measures work output. We use a bicycle for safety, and the beauty of a bike is that the person is generating the work output. They, they maintain the cadence, and they are generating the work. So the work that you see on a, on a peak test is the workload in watts being produced. We get that measure both at peak capacity, which can be compared to normative data, as well as at the anaerobic threshold. So that measures the ability to sustain work. Work can be sustained at or below that ventilatory anaerobic threshold, but not above it. It also measures the limitation. Which system is limiting the production of energy? And we can look at what is operating normally and abnormally to make that determination for what is limiting function. And then, you know, as, as I've mentioned before, uh, we come back to unmasking disability and impairment and, and looking at CPET to identify the oxygen cost of activities. And if the oxygen cost of activities is above what is available, it results in fatigue. It's very simple metric. It is an ATP limiting factor. Here are the variables, and, and they uh, there are a lot of them. And so we're not going to go through each one, but just take a look at the left-hand column, cardiovascular, and the right-hand column for each system, cardiovascular, pulmonary, metabolic, work output. There are a number of very specific metrics or variables that, that we get. Every breath, we're measuring gas exchange. Uh, we average that every 20 seconds, and so we get this nice tabular report of what's going on at rest and then throughout progressive exercise to peak. We combine that with qualitative signs and symptoms of perceived exertion, pain, dyspnea uh, after the test, how they're feeling, how long it takes them to recover. And then you have this very complete picture of functionally what is happening at rest and during exercise. Todd, I'm gonna to hand it over to you at this point. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm Todd, um, it's a privilege to be with you today. Uh, thank you so much for inviting us to be part of this symposium. My task is to discuss why two CPETs for ME-CFS, long COVID and other infection associated chronic conditions. And in telling that story, I will be discussing uh, the, the literature related to uh, CPET findings in, uh, in ME-CFS and uh, the CPET findings that are emerging in long COVID. Um, 
the thing to know here is that CPET data is highly reproducible and it's highly reproducible in athletes and people who are sedentary and in people who have many different types of diseases, as we'll see in a few more slides, um, including people who are very sick. So the abnormal case is when a person cannot reproduce their CPET results within about 6% or so. Um, that may indicate post-exertional malaise in ME-CFS, and we'll again unpack this. Now, um, various different studies, uh, as Stacy pointed out, ha have used exercise, uh, exercise as a stressor. Um, and have measured uh, metabolic mapping through metabolomics and lipidomics and other types of procedures um, that following exercise that suggests that uh, there's uh, tissue hypoxia occurring or impaired peripheral oxygen extraction occurring, uh, which in turn causes hemodynamic abnormalities such as maybe the cerebral blood flow reduction that we see uh, in MECFS during tilt testing um, as well as decoupling of uh, neurovascular status, essentially from brainstem hypoxia. Now, the Institute of Clinical Medicine um, put out a set of criteria for clinicians and researchers to use, uh, clinicians pr primarily to use, uh, involving a substantial reduction or impairment in the ability to engage in pre-illness levels of occupational, educational, social, or personal activities, um, lasting more than six months and accompanied by profound fatigue that's new, not lifelong, um, also calls for post-exertional malaise uh, and unrefreshing sleep, as well as at least one of two manifestations involving cognitive impairment, sometimes called brain fog uh, and orthostatic intolerance. Um, now, the International Consensus Criteria for Myalgic Encephalomyelitis, published by Carruthers and colleagues in 2011, uh, on which Stacy was a co-author, uh, specifies what we call post-exertional neuroimmune exhaustion as being the key, um, kind of the key feature of, of, of ME, uh, involving a rapid physical and cognitive fatigability that's worse after, um, after exertion, resulting in exhaustion, resulting in prolonged recovery times, as well as low thresholds uh, that, that result in, in substantial and often progressive reduction in pre-illness activity levels. So you can see uh, already that post-exertional malaise and post-exertional neuroimmune exhaustion are highly unusual uh, recovery responses to, um, to different types of activities. And so of course we're, we're exercise scientists, I'm a physical therapist, and so you're gonna hear a lot about exercise from me, but the NIH intramural study uh, headed, in this case, headed up by uh, Stessman and her colleagues found that uh, according to focus groups of individuals who had received cardiopulmonary exercise testing, uh, that not only physical activities result in PEM, but also precipitated by cognitive effort. Th things as simple as reading a book, or listening to music, or being in new surroundings. Vacations are not restorative. Uh, driving, even attending a, a doctor's appointment, or maybe even a research uh, appointment for, for participating in research. Uh, and then finally, there are emotion-precipitated um, features of post-exertional malaise as well that you see uh, on the screen. And so the symptoms of post-exertional malaise uh, are this severe exhaustion, Exhaustion does not fairly characterize this, um, this symptom. It, it is the feeling of nothing left, uh, not even able to move your head and limbs. Uh, but notice also in the word clouds, um, people on the daily are having hard time thinking clearly, headaches and migraines, feeling feverish. Uh, following CPET, many of these signs and symptoms are magnified, they're worsened. Uh, following following a, a, a physical exertion. So um, again, there's there's a correlation between the signs and symptoms that people experience every day that are then pulled out um, with cardiopulmonary exercise testing. Um, this data is from uh, Dr. Lily Chu and her colleagues uh, did some questionnaire work in people reporting post-exertional malaise and found that physical and cognitive exertion uh, is more likely to provoke more symptoms and signs of post-exertional malaise than emotional distress. 
So this is not a psychopathology. This is not a mood disorder. This is uh, post-exertional malaise is an artifact of, uh, of excessive physical and cognitive exertion. Um, these clever researchers also asked, um, how long does it take between um, a, an exertion, whether this is cognitive or physical, uh, or in rare instances, emotional, and how long does it take for you to develop PEM? Uh, and, it, and it can vary, so it depends. And so as researchers, we really need to pay attention to this onset latency because it muddies the waters between cause and effect. Uh, many different triggers can take place. Finding the specific trigger or combination of triggers can be challenging. Uh, and so clinicians and researchers need to be uh, be savvy with that. And then, you know, how how long does the post-exertional malaise last? And again, uh, a, a plurality reported it can vary, um, often two to seven days, but, you know, it can vary based on the trigger, the amount of the trigger experienced and so forth. So again, uh, in research, we really have to do a good job of characterizing this highly individualized experience of post-exertional malaise. Um, so here, speaking of the, the high individualization, um, here are some quotes from some mixed methods work that our group did uh, interviewing people after, po after uh, cardiopulmonary exercise testing. Uh, people felt physically drained, mentally spent, felt like they'd been in a barrel and rolled downhill through a trauma, hit by a Mack truck. Um, all week, just couldn't find enough energy to get going. Again, this whole idea of not being able to lift your, your head and your, your, your limbs, having to recline, and then also having terrible headaches like someone had struck the back of my neck with a baseball bat. So um, it, it, you just cannot undersell the severity of the symptoms and signs of post-exertional malaise as well as their resulting um, disability. Uh, Dr. Mark Van Ness, who is a, a scientific advisor in our group, um, headed up a, a study uh, a few years ago now uh, in which uh, he compared the symptom experience of a single cardiopulmonary exercise test done on a cycle ergometer like you see in the corner of the screen. Um, so um, had uh, 25 women with ME-CFS, 23 age-matched sedentary women, undergo cardiopulmonary exercise testing, and then uh, completed open-ended symptom questionnaires right after the task, 24 hours later and one week later. Um, and so on the, uh, on the side here, you can see that uh, you've, got, you've got immediate sort of in this row, you've got 24 hours later, and then you've got one week later in the far row. And then you have uh, the symptoms by code, numeric code. So one corresponds with fatigue and so forth. What you can appreciate right away is that, you know, the, the sedentary control participants on the top had fewer signs and symptoms than the folks down here with MECFS. Um, you know, the fatigue right after getting off the exercise of the cycle ergometer, muscle and joint pain, uh, is here, and then weakness and instability. Those are pretty normal findings after a CPET you just exerted maximally. So it's sort of what you expect. It's why we keep a bucket in the room. Um, but you'll notice also that there are other symptoms that were not expressed, uh, like lightheadedness and vertigo and cognitive dysfunction and insomnia and sore throat and swollen glands. But if you look down here in the folks with uh, MECFS, right when they first got off the cycle, uh, you could see that something different was happening, a very different symptom experience was happening, that not only were the common ex symptoms uh, expressed more frequently, but all of these more these unusual symptoms and signs also were being expressed. So things like lightheadedness and vertigo and cognitive dysfunction, um, insomnia, sore throat, swollen glands. And that one week later, just as many people uh, in the CFS group were reporting severe physical fatigue as almost when they first got off the cycle. And that certain of these um, symptoms magnified, muscle and joint pain got more frequent over time. Um, headaches got more frequent over time. Um, cognitive dysfunction got more frequent over time. And so here you have a whole host of symptoms that are becoming magnified over time and getting worse. And, and here you see even insomnia getting more frequent, 
sore throat, swollen glands. So again, just showing the, the, the extreme differences in uh, symptom experience following cardiopulmonary exercise testing. Here are the symptom responses to two bouts of maximal exercise within 24 hours. And again, you can see that in the MECFS group uh, on top compared to the control sedentary control participants on the bottom, uh, the control participants had far fewer symptoms improving more quickly. The participants with MECFS had a slower recovery uh, and more symptoms uh, and, and disa disablement reported. The time to recover in the Van Ness paper um, was 20, within 24 hours, about 85% of the control uh, participants had experienced a full recovery. Uh, in contrast, none of the subjects with MECFS had recovered. Uh, the, the, the remaining control participants recovered within, two, within about two days, but only one subject with MECFS recovered within 48 hours, suggesting uh, impaired uh, post-activity recovery dynamics that occur in MECFS compared to uh, controls. Our group has identified a, a general time course for post-exertional malaise, and we, we differentiate between immediate, short-term, and long-term PEM. Uh, immediate PEM are similar to uh, first getting off the exercise uh, ergo the, the cycle ergometer there after a maximal test, um, but the symptoms are out of, tend to be more out of scale with the exertion in people with MECFS. Uh, so you have fatigue, dyspnea, dizziness, and nausea. Generally speaking, in healthy folks, these, these uh, signs and symptoms abate fairly quickly. But again, as we saw earlier, more unusual symptoms and signs in people with MECFS and a prolonged recovery time are what we expect, um, including short-term symptoms of post-exertional malaise involving muscle and joint pain and cognitive dysfunction and headache and sleep disturbance, uh, which really reflect this neuro, neurovascular uh, neurological cardiopulmonary dysfunction that we see in post-exertional malaise. And then finally, long-term post-exertional malaise involves weakness and decrease in function, flu-like symptoms, perhaps consistent with, uh, with, with viral reactivation uh, and severe cardiopulmonary symptoms uh, may, may result from more prolonged um, uh, activities over, over a person's ability to be able to function. So one cardiopulmonary exercise test, as Stacy mentioned, is great to identify specific problems in, in different systems. Um, and so, you know, in deconditioned folks, we expect the VO2 to be less. We expect anaerobic threshold to be relatively normal or maybe slightly decreased. Uh, we expect peak heart rate to be normal, maybe slightly decreased. Uh, we expect breathing and oxygen saturation to be all normal in people who are deconditioned. But one cardiopulmonary exercise test does not assess the ability for a person to recover, which is what we think is important in, uh, in people with infection-associated chronic conditions who have post-exertional malaise. So why two cardiopulmonary exercise tests? Well, the first CPET is used to identify a baseline. Um, in addition, in addition, the CPET provides an individualized stressor to induce uh, post-exertional malaise. And the second CPET is then there to um, basically measure the physiology of the post-exertional state. Um, it, in a lot of, lot, lot of uh, uh, studies that just do one exercise test, they're missing a whole bunch of data and a whole bunch of important observations about the post-exertional state by not doing that second a uh, cardiopulmonary exercise test. Here's a chart that just looks at percent variations uh, between tests in people um, with, um, with, with different types of health conditions. And so you have a whole host of different conditions that are in, in which these, um, these variables, these measurements are highly reliable and reproducible. So again, uh, not being able to reproduce these variables is abnormal. Um, the Institute of Medicine recognizes the two-day CPET protocol uh, as an objective measure of recovery after physical exertion and also as an adjunct to the diagnosis of MECFS. And again, uh, the existence of post-exertional malaise as determined by two-day CPET can help physicians confirm the diagnosis. So in the way of hot-off-the-press research in MECFS, 
uh, our colleague, Dr. Betsy Keller uh, and her team uh, did uh, the one of the, lar the largest two-day CPET studies to date um, in, um, in, in this population uh, and essentially uh, looked at 84 individuals with MECFS and 71 age-matched control uh, individuals. And, and what they found was that the, uh, the impairment ratings based on the maximal oxygen uh, capacity uh, at peak was, was not substantially different uh, between people with MECFS and age-matched sedentary, age and gender-matched sedentary controls. But what we find is that the impairment at, of, of oxygen uptake at the ventilatory anaerobic threshold uh, demonstrated more disability on the second test compared to the first test. Um, VAT is is where is the ceiling at which people comfortably function. Uh, after you exceed your ventilatory anaerobic threshold, you'll start to lose your breath, legs will start burning. This is when you run into the top of the flight of stairs and have to catch your breath quickly. And in people who are healthy, that process does not take very long. But what these data suggest is that the ventilatory anaerobic, anaerobic threshold or the ceiling for functional activity actually worsens in people with MECFS, uh, which is dependent on a prior exertion. So while they're experiencing the symptoms and signs of post-exertional malaise that we saw in earlier slides, they also have a, an altered metabolism, an altered aerobic metabolism, where we can say that the aerobic energy system is not working properly. Um, and so that's a, that, that turns out to be a key finding in MECFS. Corresponding to that, we find that lactate concentrations that are uh, indicative of when aerobic metabolism uh, starts to, begins to end, <laughs> um, lactate concentrations increase earlier during exercise tasks in people with MECFS on the second uh, cardiopulmonary exercise test compared to the first, and uh, also increase earlier and faster than, than sedentary controls. So we, we would say that the lactate accumulation curve tends to shift to the left, um, suggesting uh, a broken aerobic metabolism and an over-reliance on uh, anaerobic metabolism. So what about long COVID? Um, we, we did a retrospective review of records at the WorkWell Foundation for cases involving physician diagnosed and self-identified long COVID involving two CPETs conducted 24 hours apart. Uh, and all of the participants met uh, criteria for a maximal cardiopulmonary exercise test. And what we found was uh, relatively small declines of two to 4% across measurements, uh, small to moderate effect sizes at peak uh, exertion involving aerobic capacity, uh, the percent predicted aerobic capacity based on uh, based on age and gender, uh, workload, um, heart rate, and minute ventilation. But the interesting stuff happened at the ventilatory anaerobic threshold where we found much larger percent changes in effect sizes with volume of oxygen, the percent predicted VO2, also workload, unfortunately missed the yellow highlighting there. But those are all variables that we see as being important also in MECFS. And so while long COVID seems to have different triggers and slightly different disease dynamics, uh, it certainly seems to have many of the similar attributes that we see on two-day CPET uh, that we the uh, in in people with MECFS, and so if we look at the American Medical Association impairment rating of this sample from uh, based on peak VO two between test one and test two, we generally see a shift towards more disability uh, on test two compared to test one. Uh, so again, those the yellow are the ones that reproduced and stayed the same. The red the red uh, boxes are the ones that had folks who had worsened. Uh, you had a few few folks get better uh, just because life is weird and science is science. Um, uh, they changed maybe a fraction of a fraction of a milliliter per kilogram per minute. Um, and so they managed to to get themselves into a better impairment category, but that was not the norm. So in summary, we see again this abnormal metabolism in post-exertional malaise that seems to affect the aerobic energy system. So we think an increased time spent, anaerobic metabolism after about two minutes of exertion uh, tends to increase the risk for aggravating signs, symptoms, and functional impairment of post-exertional malaise. 
And so perhaps a useful clinical analogy for bioenergetics is a plug-in hybrid car. And I credit Dr. Chris Snell with this work, uh, this, this analogy that I've, that I've ripped off and I'm doing my best to give justice to and, and add to as I go. Um, but a plug-in hybrid car has two fuel sources. It has a battery and it has a gas motor. Uh, the battery is good for getting around over flat surfaces, uh, over um, sort of stop and go traffic in town, relatively slower speeds, while the gas motor is better for driving freeway speeds, going up and down hill, hauling gear, and the gas motor also can charge the battery. Well, what happens if you have a dysfunctional gas motor? Uh, you lose the ability for higher end types of activities, more prolonged types of activities, and you lose the ability to charge the, the battery or the short-term energy system. So by analogy, the gas motor is the aerobic energy system, and the battery tends to be the more of the short-term energy systems. And uh, the dysfunctional gas motor is um, modeling what we think is happening. Uh, in people with infection-associated chronic conditions who experience post-exertional malaise. I think we're over our 40 minutes, and I would love to be able to answer questions, Todd, so maybe we can just conclude. Um, if you can advance to almost the very end. I'll cut time. this part out, but we're only at 31 minutes. Oh. <laughs> I, le I left you 10 minutes. You left me 10. Never mind. Okay, here we go. So I'm um, so give me give me some quiet so I can just like and okay. then I can cut it and then and then just maybe five seconds. Okay. So what is the difference between a CPET and a stress test? I started off uh alluding to this, but many people just don't know. And when you add gas exchange, you get three things. What you get by adding the mask and adding an O2 analyzer and a CO2 analyzer is you, you have the ability to look at oxygen consumption, carbon dioxide production, and ventilation. And that allows you to add to a, a traditional stress test, which is just a 12 lead EKG and blood pressure during exercise. So in addition to getting a picture of what's going on with the heart, you add to that what's going on with the lungs and you add to that what's happening with metabolism. And so you get this trifecta of multiple systems, which is a beautiful thing. Uh, we get this a lot. I think there's a, um, a misconception that completing a CPET takes a very long time, like hours. And I'm not sure why this is, but the goal of a CPET to get from rest to peak or maximal effort if done correctly is eight to 12 minutes, even if you're an elite athlete. So whether you're an elite athlete, I wanna get you to peak in 10 minutes, or if you're a patient with a chronic condition, we adjust the workload accordingly to get you to max relatively quickly. And just, uh, we typically use a 15 watt per minute ramping protocol. And so to give you a perspective on that, it in order to fill workload on a, a cycle ergometer, you don't feel it until about 30 watts of work, which is two minutes into our protocol. So it's very light and easy for the first three to four minutes, and then it gets progressively harder until the, the patient can no longer maintain the cadence. So it's really difficult for a couple of minutes, and our tests tend to be on the shorter side. So we get them to peak usually in eight minutes, maybe a little bit less. How do we prepare our clients for testing? Uh, I, this is important if you're considering doing this uh, for research or clinically, is to let patients know that this testing is designed to cause PIM. We want the patients to come in the rested state. Todd, if you could advance to the next slide. Um, come rested so that we can get that baseline rested and then create post-exertional malaise with this very standardized stressor and evaluate to see if there's any differences between the days. We tell patients to plan to rest following the testing and that they should know what their recovery trajectory is when they overdo activities or go out grocery shopping. Uh, they should have an idea of their recovery time. Uh, another really helpful tool is 
oral or ideally IV saline uh, can really help shorten and improve recovery time. So we had a patient undergo test retest and then come back a couple of years later to, to repeat the process. Uh, the first test took her three weeks to recover. Uh, she did IV saline after the two years later after the second test and shortened that recovery trajectory to two days. So you can really ameliorate some symptoms by, by adding some strategies. Uh, we also did some research looking at slow versus fast recovery. And this is where knowing your PIM trajectory becomes really helpful. And this study looked at 51 patients and we asked them how long it took them to recover. And I'm always surprised when I see that fast recovery group. I think we all have in our minds, this takes a long time to recover from. And 49% of our patients took 4.5 days on average to recover, whereas 51% took seven days or longer. And from this large NIH study, we asked these same questions. A recovery paper was just published in the last year uh, that showed 96% of the patients recovered on average in three weeks. And so there probably was also that fast and slow recovery group. But, but that means that, you know, that, that was the average. We're not seeing patients take an exorbitant amount of time to recover. So what do the results tell us? I think we, we get, uh, these are typical conclusions. And we look at these seven areas, we assign to them a normal or abnormal response. We look at, did the patient try? And we can objectively measure with that ratio of oxygen to carbon dioxide if they gave a good effort or not. So we immediately rule out malingering, which insurance companies like. And if anything else is abnormal, it means there's a problem. Todd mentioned reproducibility. If, if test one and test two don't match up really closely, there's a problem. We can look me at metabolic workload, cardiovascular, and pulmonary responses, both in terms of sedentary normative data that we match to the patient, as well as their test one to test two responses to see if they're normal. And then lastly, the patient's self-reportive recovery. How long did it take them to recover? And and what sorts of symptoms did they experience? So these are all the conclusions. Uh, we, we mentioned this earlier, Todd threw up the slide of all the conditions, but gas exchange measurements are highly reproducible if the methods are consistent. The American Heart Association says three to 4% variability is seen for most, not healthy individuals, but most patient groups. Next slide. So if you're asking yourself, what's the big deal about reproducibility? Um, people can reproduce this. Sick people can reproduce this test between three to 4%. And so it's really helpful for research, but also to support a disability claim. And this is where we're unmasking PIM with that second day CPET and showing where patients actually function on a day-to-day -day basis. And again, this is the normal versus abnormal response. We're very conservative and generous. We say that if it's greater than 8%, that is outside the normal range of variability and demonstrating a lack of homeostasis in peak oxygen consumption, looking at the cardiovascular response to determine if there's autonomic dysfunction, looking at lung function and those ventilatory measures to see if they're outside the normal range for ventilatory, ventilatory dysfunction. And even if one of these things is abnormal, it's going to provide a functional impairment. Uh, you can go on to the next slide. So how do we translate this, these results into impairment status? Our number one big ticket item is oxygen consumption, the ability to use oxygen to produce energy. And this can be represented as a, a MET, a metabolic equivalent of task, which is 3.5 milliliters per kilogram of oxygen. That is one MET or one times resting level. And the American College of Sports Medicine has published the Compendium of Physical Activities, which lists all sorts of recreational and occupational activities and assigns them a metabolic equivalent of task which is very helpful for disability evaluation. So you can see that it takes three METs 
for home activities, including cleaning and sweeping. Now, if you're going to carry some groceries upstairs, that all of a sudden jumps way up to 7.5 mets. And if you're just sitting here listening to me right now uh, and fidgeting slightly, you're using 1.8 mets. And we get these numbers for oxygen consumption at both peak and the ventilatory threshold or anaerobic threshold that equate to impairment categories. This is the Weber criteria that we use to evaluate the oxygen cost or the metabolic cost of daily activities. And the bottom line is the, if the oxygen cost of daily activities is above what the patient has available, it will cause fatigue. And it tears them into an impairment category. So to sum up, CPET is a valuable tool for both research and, and for clinical uses. It looks at the multiple coordinated actions required to deliver and use oxygen. We get a multi-system look at the heart, at the lungs, at metabolism, all working together to produce energy and whether or not after a standardized stressor, patients are able to recover and reproduce their results on test two, which typically we see deficits from test one to test two in our patient populations. And note that for disability evaluation and unmasking PIM, if there's a problem in one system, it can provide functional limitations, but even subtle de deficits across several systems can produce these dramatic changes in physiological function that, that really limit a person's activity to participate in work. And now we'd love to open it up for questions and discussion. Thank you so much for having us. Okay, great. Okay, um, thank you both for um, joining us. That was, I don't know where to look. <laughs> <laughs> that was a wonderful talk. Um, we have some questions, um, one from online, um, people that joined us. So um, the first one is, uh, can you describe this lactate shift a little more? How is this measured? And is this something that um, a physician might be thinking of doing? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. So the lactate shift is uh, done by doing needle stick blood draws periodically throughout a cardiopulmonary exercise test. So it's it's done based on the on a blood on a, a blood kind of a blood test uh, analysis. the The analysis itself is not um, is not difficult, but um, the reason that we use vent ventilatory parameters instead of lactates um, is because it improves patient comfort. Uh, not having to be stuck during the test. Um, lactate lactates do correlate highly with ventilatory parameters, and so uh, the the breath by breath analysis that we do um, is is for all intents and purposes just as good as the lactate analysis. Um, what the lactate study showed that I went over um, is that there was a a, a steeper rise in, um, in in lactate concentration among people with ME-CFS undergoing a cardiopulmonary exercise test that was that that rise was further steepened on the second test compared to the first test and steeper compared to controls. Um, and so we see the same um, we see the same findings uh, with the ventilatory data, just with improved patient comfort. So as for uh, a clinical recommendation, obviously I'm a physical therapist and so I'm always careful to stay in my lane here, but uh, just uh, considering um, the fact that we're already inducing post-exertional malaise in a two-day CPET, um, sticking sticking people for uh, for 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 blood draws also is um, just adds to uh, some of the discomfort of the test. And so, uh, use because ventilatory data and the lactate data are are just as good. Um, then I would I would recommend a recommend against uh, routinely collecting bloods. All right. Um, thank you so much. Um, we have two similar questions next. Um, they are um, uh, especially related to Social Security disability application. Where can patients get um, this test? Um, one question was how long um, 
if there's a wait list, um, maybe you could um, put your contact information in. And also, um, does insurance generally cover this test? Uh, so in terms of social security disability and the wait list, uh, just contact workwellfoundation.org. And usually we can get patients in between, uh, within a month, usually two to three weeks. So we don't have a very long wait time. Uh, does insurance cover it? We don't bill insurance. We're exercise scientists, but we do provide a super bill so patients can submit to their insurance for reimbursements. All right. Um, thank you. Um, then there's one more question. Um, during the procedure, do you get feedback from the patient? And what about the patient who can, let's say, only go for four minutes and then reaches their peak? Is that, inf imagining it's like, is that information still going to be helpful? Uh, let's yeah. say they can't complete the whole test. So we, the patient can talk throughout the test. There's a mask on their face. But uh, we ask them every minute during exercise how hard they feel they're working. It, they can let us know if they have any discomfort, any chest pain, any shortness of breath. They're free to stop the test at any time. Uh, we never force them you know, to go longer. They're in charge of the test. And they simply, they're in charge, so it's not, they're not on a treadmill. They can simply stop pedaling at any time that they want to. We rarely have a four-minute test. So, you know, we coach our patients that they need to give a good effort. And if we have correctly sel selected the protocol, we will get enough data uh, to provide mm -hmm. that window. Um, now, is there anybody here in the audience that would like to ask a question? We have one here. Thank you. Uh, thank you both for not just the talk, but for your decade. It's a really pioneering work, uh, helping our community. Uh, I have a question um, regarding the, uh, I guess, clinical uh, value of this particular test. It's very clear that for diagnostic purposes and insurance purposes, this is sort of the gold standard. But using this test, can it uh, help to advise a physician on treatment what did you get that or do you want me to take it um yeah why don't you start and i'll i'll fill in perfect so there there are like i said over 51 conditions that can be diagnosed that have a cpet signature or profile and typically cardiologists pulmonologists we, we don't diagnose but it can aid a physician in MECFS to diagnose PIMP because we can objectively characterize that. So it can help with the diagnosis of MECFS. We think it's extremely helpful in ruling out heart disease and lung disease and metabolic disorders. And by seeing a normal or abnormal response, it should be able to help a physician do that. And then Todd, you want to talk about the functional aspects? Yeah, um, and just to piggyback, um, a person can have more than one thing. So, and we're we're seeing this, you know, increasingly with long COVID that folks may have pulmonary compromise in addition to post-exertional malaise. And so, we've got the potential to uh, be able to work up the cardiopulmonary manifestations of the d disease alongside the metabolic ones. Um, and so, um, so, so again, CPEC can be in. in and specifically two-day CPEC can be extremely valuable in the diagnostic process. But as a physical therapist, I'm always interested in how much a person is capable of doing on a given day. Um, this is especially helpful for, for people like me who are interested in helping to coach and pacing protocols uh, and establish, you know, maybe um, you, sort of daily, daily expectations of help, help a person establish daily expectations based on objective data of what they can expect from their bodies. Um, and so the day one, day two uh, discrepancy is often very helpful from the perspective of showing uh, the decline in the post-exertional state, uh, in addition to setting kind of this, uh, kind of this, um, uh, you know, this expectation of, hey, if you go over a certain, uh, certain number of, of a certain amount of METs, uh, you know, certain metabolic, number of metabolic equivalents on a daily basis, you might expect uh, a crash um, to, to occur. And so... Um, again, calibrating a person's daily activities, um, structuring a pacing program around objective data is always very helpful. Um, thank you again. And uh, maybe that's uh, wonderful because I 
um, didn't include in my um, brief introduction for time limits, um, the idea, the concept of pacing. Um, so maybe, uh, you know, I can give a little bit that pacing is done to sort of um, counteract or prevent preventative measure to not go through a crash, which normally happens um, in um, when you're having post-exertional malaise. So what is what is one thing that you can take from your study then to help you show with pacing? Like, is there a certain like uh, uh, number that you know, like, oh, uh, like you're, you're suggesting those activities have certain graded levels of exercise? Can you say then like, you know, um, maybe you want to pace this way or pace that way, do this exercise a certain number of days. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and thanks for that. So p pacing really is in, in the broadest sense is balancing activities with rest. Uh, and as you mentioned, in the pursuit of um, reducing the likelihood or preventing um, post-exertional malaise or these crashes or exacerbations. Uh, there are a few different values on CPET that can be useful. Uh, the metabolic equivalents, which come from the VO2 data, can be helpful in that because it gives us a sense of um, sort of the, the, the maximal, you know, and, and um, ventilatory anaerobic threshold um, activity intensities that are possible. So we can use that information in the development of, a, of some pacing guidelines, uh, especially going back to the compendium uh, of physical activities that Stacy mentioned in her talk, uh, really kind of taking a look at, you know, what do these met values mean in terms of actual activities during daily life? And then the second um, very useful parameter that comes out of cardiopulmonary exercise testing, uh, especially two days, is um, the use of heart rate um, to be able to uh, monitor activity intensities in real time. So um, the, there, there are all kinds of wearables out there on the market that can be used to fairly reliably measure heart rate in real time. Um, and so taking the heart rate at ventilatory anaerobic threshold from the second day of a two-day CPET in particular is a number that I look at uh, in terms of helping a person uh, be able to pace their activities in real time using a heart rate monitor. So, um, all right, thank you. And um, Stacy, one question is: um, Do you see how does this relate to cognitive function? Um, would you measure some of the same? I'm imagining they're asking like some would same with these same differences be picked up doing a cognitive function, because that can induce PEM, but here you're do doing exercise. So have you done that where you looked at inducing PEM by uh, cognitive and then seeing the same differences? We, we have, um, we've looked at reaction time tests and they're complicated and, and sort of all over the map, the results. So we've not found consistent results with just looking at cognitive functioning alone. Uh, the CPEP picks up on the metabolic function. It doesn't measure the cognitive issues. Uh, we d have done a pilot study with a, a startup company called Lumia that is measuring blood flow to the head. We did a two-day CPET with a healthy control uh, and with a patient with ME-CFS and, and long COVID, and the patient's blood flow to her head dropped. Uh, at baseline, it was a little bit lower, and then after the CPET, it was 17% lower. So we think that there may be a huge link between blood flow to the head and post-exertional malaise, and that will be our next uh, research study. So we're, we're excited about that, tying that together. Um, that's wonderful. Um, let me see if there's any last questions here in the audience. Um, does anybody have any more? Um, uh, so thank you so much for joining us in this unusual <laughs> Uh, simulation, I, I guess, of you being here. And the, the video was great. I really appreciate it. And um, thank you for joining us. And I'm, I'm sure we'll be in touch again. Um, thank you. Thank you for thank you. having us. Um, so actually, uh, for the concluding remarks, um, I could give what I didn't give before, which um, was that conclusion on my slide. This, uh, so some things we want to think about um, for MECFS, long COVID, and IECCs, obviously, are, um, you know, providing more provider education, um, clinical research, clinical trials, being inclusive of all of the different IECCs. Um, there's a very big interest in long COVID. However, as I mentioned, historically, MECFS, and I, had, I didn't even have time to cover Lyme, have been sort of maligned. And I think that um, uh, puts them in a position that the disease should be um, uh, recognize on its own standing and not just sort of like an offshoot from long COVID. And also that there's patients that are still out there 
that have been ill for, you know, um, 30 plus years, you know, there, there should be some um, making amends to them um, in the medical community. Um, and then also, um, you know, hopefully, you know, as um, was shared with Patricia, we are on the way of like improvements and there's going to be, there's already been an incredible um, amount of research. There was already historical MEC of CFS research, but now even with long COVID and Lyme that are just, you know, exploding, let's say. Um, and it will be great to have that um, come back to the patient. And thank you, everyone. I wanted to thank again um, the speakers for Patricia, for Stacy and Todd, um, also for the department and MassME, um, MassME, CFS and FM Association. Um, they've been wonderful. They're really a good community um, source for people looking for um, help and um, providers and different um, support for the diseases. Um, thank you again for coming.